We good? Okay. Good evening. Uh, welcome uh, to the March 21, 2022 school board meeting for the Marshtown Community School District. Uh, welcome to those of you here with us in person. Welcome to anybody watching us uh, on the live stream or anybody who tunes in later on. A um, couple of housekeeping things before we get going. There's a pink sheet up here on the speaker's table uh, for anyone who's here for public comment. Um, if you sign up or if you have something to tell us, uh, you'll be allowed five minutes to speak. Uh, please keep in mind that Iowa law prohibits discussing specific employees of the district or their job performance. Please also know that in accordance with board policy, board members may not respond to your comments in order to comply with the open meetings laws. Um, let me introduce the board members here tonight. To my right, Zach Wall, Bonnie Lowry, Jan McGinnis. To my left, Karina Hernandez, Sarah Faltis, Leah Stanley. I am Sean Heitman. Joining me here at the center table is Paulette Newbold, our board secretary, and Dr. Theron Schutte, superintendent of schools. And our student school board members here tonight are Haley Reed, Aaron Seberger, and Phoebe Hermanson. Would you all please join me in uh, reciting the Marshalltown School District mission statement? We, we develop, develop learners, learners who, who have, have the knowledge, skills, and, and positive mindset to successfully pursue a meaningful, a meaningful future through personalized learning experiences. And please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any changes to the agenda for tonight? Yes, uh, we have two amendments. One in 2.02 .02 personnel, there'll be a recommendation for hire for the Rogers Elementary School principal. And then 4.03 student enterprise recommendation will be uh, tabling that until the April 4th meeting. Uh, with that, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Faltus Hernandez, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries, seven to zero. Mr. Sodders. Good evening, everyone. We have another uh, set of state level uh, performers here for you tonight. So uh, I wanted to present Jeremiah, excuse me, Jeremiah Hernandez and Andrea Montes Melendez. Uh, who are here after a great performance at uh, state speech, state individual speech. So do you guys want to come on up? And and uh, joining them is Joe Froline, who uh, coaches speech. Okay. They're a little nervous. They always get nervous in front of you guys. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, so I have with me Jeremiah Hernandez and Andrea Montez Melendez. Uh, these two individuals qualified for performance nods at Allstate. So they will be go traveling to you and I on the 28th, and they will be performing at Allstate. Uh, Andrea is one of six orators that wrote her piece and she's hoping to perform it for you tonight and Jeremiah is one of 10 poetry performers so I will let Andrea take it and go from there yeah you can it can move with you oh, sorry. <laughs> it's your choice okay what is achievement achievement is something that is personal to each and every person. I would like to start with a quote from my English teacher, Jocelyn Froen. Achievement is not the standing on top of the mountain. Achievement is the steps that you conquer going up the mountain. I can't stand here and not acknowledge the cultural diversity in this room. And I cannot be blind to the diversity that happens in America. This is representative in my school district. Every year, 
dozens of students move from different parts of Latin America, and in fact from all over the world, with the hope of a better education, just like me. I moved to the U.S. in June of 2020, and I knew that I wanted to have the high school experience that I would see in the movies. Walking in those long hallways full of lockers, going to football games, and most of all, wearing that funny little cap and gown with my <laughs> diploma in my hand. There was a problem with that. A very obvious one, but something I did not acknowledge until I was at my new high school. I didn't know English. When I say I didn't know English, I'm talking about simple things. For instance, asking to go to the bathroom, asking for the nurse, and so much more. I didn't know enough to do my English homework or ask questions in class. And Google Translate was not always a reliable source. <laughs> It would switch up the way a subject and a verb was used and give me the ground verb tenses. Everyone talked so fast, it was difficult to keep up. But I also had a dream, to go to college. I didn't know how I was going to make it happen, but I knew I would make it happen. I set a goal in my head. Just try. Try to speak in class, even if I was scared of not saying it right. Try to do my homework and look for help, even with a language barrier. Try every day, step by step. Luckily, I had a very insistent English teacher who did not let me isolate myself in a bubble of shyness and would draw from others when I didn't know. It was a very difficult process. I was pushed to talk, read, and learn how to pronounce words, even when I had no confidence. In her class, everyone tries. Everyone works and everyone grows. She doesn't allow anyone to hide in the shadows and makes it comfortable for people to learn from their mistakes. We were treated like a family. I was, and still am, surrounded by people who motivate me to succeed. Teachers and staff that want a better future for me. They keep me focused on my goal and remind me to persevere. They are there for me, holding me up when I'm frustrated or feeling a bit challenged. I know that I can go to them for help, guidance, and support. Persistence means firm or obstinate continuance in a course of action, in spite of difficulty or position. But being persistent is not easy when there are many obstacles in front of you making you think, why am I doing this? Is this really worth it? Am I always going to struggle with adversity? I decided to do it for myself, for what I want to do with my future for the life I aspire to have and the things I want to do. If you allow yourself to feed into your fear, you will get nowhere. In fighting my fear, I am traveling up my mountain. And with every step taken, I'm slowly getting closer to my goal. I was very scared of each of those steps. I was scared of failing my classes, but I didn't. I was scared of not getting into dual credit courses, but I did. I was extremely scared of not getting accepted into college, but I can proudly say I did. I was even scared of asking to go to the bathroom in class because I thought I wouldn't say it right. Letting go of that fear changed the way I saw this challenge as an opportunity to be a better version of myself. On my journey, I have found people with similar stories to mine, struggling with the same obstacles and overcoming them day by day. Each one of us finds our path in the long, winding trail, creating a goal for each month that we take. In this journey, I have learned a few tricks or strategies to make it easier for me to climb. One such strategy is I keep a list of words I can't pronounce on my phone to work on them so I can use them in the future. I look up each one that I don't know and write down what it means. I no longer see my mistakes as false. I now see them as an opportunity to grow. I am no longer afraid of not knowing how to pronounce a word. And the best part is that I'm not scared to ask. Thinking about all the obstacles that were in my way, I realized they were all in my head. Persistence showed me that every little step I take gets me closer towards my goal. And that is the actual real achievement. Nobody judges you for trying. Nobody judges you for misspelling a word or for speaking with an accent. This country is so rich in diversity that speaking is the last obstacle to communication. 
we live in diversity. We are joined by diversity. We thrive through diversity. And we make our dreams come true through diversity. I have climbed that mountain step by step, seeing my goal within reach. Now is the time to put on the mortar hat with the seal of biliteracy around my neck, walking that stage to my new dream. And once I accomplish that one, I will create a new one. Dreams are meant to be achieved. And even though the path may be difficult, I have step up the mountain and I am ready for the goals throughout my life. Thank you. actually wrote that herself so I give her kudos because there's some difficult words in there and she really strives to learn new words and when she hears them she writes them down in her journal and it's kind of neat to watch. Uh, Jeremiah is going for poetry and he is going to recite some poetry for you. Before the Birth of One of Her Children by Anne Bradstreet is a poem um, from Anne Bradstreet, one of the earliest American poets in 1612 when she came here in the May weather. During this time, death was extremely prevalent with mothers dying during childbirth or children dying before they could even fully grow up. And so this poem was a testament to one of her children as she was pregnant in case of the coming of her passing. <clears throat> Before the Birth of One of Her Children by Anne Bradstreet. All things within this fading world hath end. Adversity doth still our joys attend. No tie so strong, no friend so dear and sweet, but with death's parting blow is sure to meet. The sentence passes most irrevocable, a common thing yet, oh, inevitable. How soon, my dear, death may my steps attend. How soon may be thy lot to lose thy friend. We are both ignorant, yet love bids me these farewell lines to recommend to thee, that when that knot untied that made us one, I may seem thine who in fact am none. And if I see not half my days that's due, what nature would God grant to yours and you? The many faults you well know I have, let be interred in my oblivious grave. If any worth or virtue were in me, let thy live freshly in thy memory. When thou feel'st no grief as I no harms, yet love thy dead who long lay in thine arms, and when thy loss shall be repaid with gains, look to my little babes, my dear remains, and if thou love thyself or lovest me, these all protect from step dame's injury, and if chance of thine eye shall bring this verse, with some sad sighs honor my absent hearse, and kiss this paper for thy love's dear sake with salt tears this last for all did take. All right, one more. An experience by Edith Wharton. Exper um, Edith Wharton is known for her many poems and her many books that she's written without her lifetime, but this often talks about the philosophical sense of death as these experiences, these people, these relationships that we've all gained throughout our lifetimes, what happens to that when we die? What happens to this treasure that, uh, that Warren likes to call it? What happens to all of it when we pass away? And so I give you Experience by Edith Wharton. Like Crusoe, with bootless gold we stand upon the desert verge of death and say, What shall avail the woes of yesterday to buy tomorrow's wisdom in the land whose currency is strange unto our hand, whose currency... Sorry, in life's small market, they had served to pay some late found rapture. Could we but delay till time hath matched our means to, demand, to our demand? But otherwise, fate was it. For behold, our gathered strength of individual pain, when time's long alchemy hath made it gold, dies with us. Hoarded all these years in vain, since those that might bear heir to it, the mold renew and coin themselves new griefs again. O oh, death! We come full-handed to thy gate, rich with the strange burden of mingled years, gains and renunciations, mirth and tears, and love's oblivion and remembering hate. Nor know we what compulsion laid such freight upon our souls, and shall our hopes and fears buy nothing of thee, death? 
Behold our wares, and sell us the one joy for which we wait. Had we lived longer like had such for sale, with the last coin of sorrow purchased cheap. But now we stand before thy shadowy pale, and all our longings lie within thy keep. Death, can it be that the year shall not avail? Not so, Death answered. They shall purchase sleep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so these two students get the honor of performing at Allstate, where that's going to be at you and I. They'll perform, and they're not too happy with me on this, in a group of about 400 to 500 audience members. Um, and it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of practice and dedication to be this good. So if you guys have any questions for them, they're willing to answer. Did I miss what grade? Andrea, are you a senior this year? And Jeremiah? <clears throat> senior as well. Senior as well. Yeah. What are your future plans? Um, I'm going to Iowa State University for uh, chemical engineering. Um, though I, if I can, I would hope to also do um, poetry and theater on the side because it's something that I've really, you know, learned to love and absolutely adore. So, and this is, a, you know, a really special moment for me because not very often do people make it to Allstate, let alone That's I didn't right, think right. I'd make it. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Nicely done. Andrea, how about you next year? What's um, going on? I'm going to DMAC in Ankeny. I want to study public relations. Nice. That's the plan for now. <laughs> Congratulations, both of you. The story you wrote, is that about your personal life? Yeah. Wow. Wow, you could be a motivated speaker. It's yeah, great. I was absolutely. speechless. I you both did great. To apply to be a student TED Talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like, mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, is, is great, all the obstacles and, and how we want to be a better self, all of us, right? Better mm -hmm. people. And I was very moved. Great job. Yeah, your strategies of survival and mm -hmm. moving on and being a successful student, you'll be successful next year too at DMAC. Yeah. So yeah. congratulations. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, that contest, the Allstate uh, Festival for Speech, is at you and I on March 28th. Uh, so we also uh, want to congratulate Landon Stanley. You saw him up here uh, several weeks ago. He performed uh, after winning our uh, district uh, contest and going on to state. Well, he went on to win that as well. So. Uh, that's that's excellent. That's the second year in a row for Marshalltown uh, High School. El uh, Elijah Teeson uh, won it last year as a senior. So the fact that Landon is a is a freshman bodes well, I think. So that'll be excellent. Um, and uh, he will compete at national at the National Poetry Out Loud competition. That's slated for May first, and it'll be live streamed on arts.gov, in case anybody would like to watch. So. Um, and then Mr. Mr. Uh, Lonnie Hoagland is here. Todd, can you see if Mark's in the hall? Or I know he just stepped out. But <clears throat> All right. I'll have you. <clears throat> so I don't know how long ago it was, Lonnie. Probably a couple months, maybe even in the fall, you had reached out to me and inquired about the possibility of uh, making some improvements over at Fisher Elementary School at the playground. And I had said, well, it's funny that you say that because Fisher is next on our list. And um, so to make long story short, I think most of you know Lonnie Hoagland um, and a graduate of Marshtown, uh, has been a great supporter of our schools and has done a lot of work in helping add equipment and spaces for recreational play at many of our elementary uh, schools over time and most recently after the unfortunate tragedy of Christian Maxson had helped us out with safety vests uh, donation as well for our crossing guards and so um, Lonnie I'll turn it over to you to say a few words and Todd Goulding is our buildings and grounds director. 
I heard somebody uh, introduce me as Mr. Hoagland. I'm just Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> the day got away from me, as you could maybe tell. Um, I knew I had a meeting to do tonight, and I beg your forgiveness for my attire, but this will help you. <laughs> this, this is what we all care about. Um, it is amazing what Marshalltown Schools did to Lonnie Hoagland Jr. He was five years old when he died, September 22nd, 98. So school starts late May, June. I'm not sure that year, 98, May, June, July, September. He passed away suddenly, unexpectedly, September 22nd, 98. And he was a student of Fisher Minnows at Fisher School. And that school helped him tremendously. Um, I can't say enough. My dad was a Marshtown graduate in 1941. Hmm. He was an older guy. He was a Marshalltown, I'm going to call it legend. Um, he was proud that he was what they called the last of the pre-war models because he was 1941. But he got a job at Fisher's. He was proud of that. And he worked away because World War II happened. He got to be a certified welder. He was welding away while the other people were drafted and did all this stuff. But he forgot his deferments, and he went away and spent 33 months in Europe. And he was a very proud Marshalltown student, as am I, class of 1986. Um, it kind of breaks my heart that I got remarried a few years. Fast forward to Olivia Crawford. I had a great seven years. It didn't work out. So I created a Luke and a Levi Hoagland, and they go to school in Grinnell. And it's like, oh, I've done all this stuff with Marshalltown. My kids are going to grow up there. But I know that I'm helping the kids of our community. I do a lot in our community with our towing business, our salvage yard, and I'm just wanting to give back. Here's 4000 towards the help. I didn't realize that it's so terribly expensive. I just drove by the swing set. The first thing that I donated to the school was that red swing set at Fisher School, and the pea gravel and the weeds were looking a little rough, and well, in 98, or that was in 2000, you did pea gravel. Well, the right way, the wrong way, and the right way is put the rubber stuff under it and make it everlasting. So this is a, a, a help, and I'm just here to say thanks for the opportunity to help. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. Yeah, I'd definitely like to tell you thank you very much. As you mentioned uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we did get the approval. Uh, we'll be working with Bolin Recreation. Um, I'll be placing a concrete curb near the grass area and rubberizing that hole. Um, with these funds, I think we'll also be purchasing two play panels to add an addition. It helps our community. You bet. And it's more than greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay, turning to the consent agenda, we've got minutes from the March 7th uh, board meeting. Anything of note in personnel? Yes, I was hoping uh, <coughs> Pam McDonald would be here, but it doesn't look like she was able to, so we'll catch her at a future meeting. But I'm very pleased to present to you a recommendation for Pam McDonald to be hired as the next elementary school uh, principal at Rogers. Pam is a 1982 graduate of Marshtown High School. Uh, she's been an educator for 35 years, uh, having served in a lot of different capacities. She's taught elementary, secondary, at-risk, ELL, special education. She's been an elementary principal, supervisor of student teachers, uh, all of that within three different states, Iowa, Minnesota, and Arizona. Upon her return to Iowa in my first year here, she had reached out saying, hey, do you guys need help anywhere? And I said, ah, we have a lot of teaching positions available, so if you're willing to do that, we'd love to have you. And so um, she interviewed and was hired as a high school ELL teacher for about a year and I think a third prior to the Department of Education snatching her up as a basically the the ELL consultant uh, for the state of Iowa and so um, 
we're very happy. We had a pool of about 24 applicants, of which we narrowed down to about four that were interviewed over a period of time. And so we'll be recommending, or I'll be recommending that Pam be hired uh, effective July 1st, 2022, pending background check and licensure at a salary of 110,000. Okay. Looking at interagency agreements and contracts, uh, there's an agreement with Morningside University for teacher education and clinical experience placements. Uh, a contract with Iowa Valley Community College District for the 22-23 academic year senior year plus program. Contract extension with Gordon Flesh Company uh, for another five years and to include six new copiers. Um, and an agreement with Employee Benefit Systems, uh, Third Party Administration Services for COBRA. Questions about any of those contracts or agreements? Uh, in open enrollments, for the current school year, there are six out and two in. All, I think, are all continuations. Uh, we have five for next year, four out and two in, and then one denial for next school year. Paul, had anything to note in bills? No, sir. And then we have Lonnie's uh, donation towards the Fisher Elementary Playground. We've got the Youth Migration in Iowa survey in the Experimental Innovation Projects. Paul, had anything in financial reports? Yes, sir. And then the last item in the consent agenda is um, moving the July board meeting from the 18th to the 11th um, so that Dr. Schutte and Mr. Sodders can attend an out-of-state conference and not miss our board meeting. <laughs> Questions about anything in the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move to approve. Second. Lowry Faltus. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Uh, are there any abstentions? Yes. Motion carries 6-0 with one abstention. I remembered. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody on the pink sheet? Okay. No. In that case, Mr. Glenn, Mrs. Kell, and all of your friends, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> That seems right. I mean, yeah. you should take the shortest should, chair, the right? Short <laughs> <laughs> Makes me sit up straight. Yeah. You need a microphone, though? Not yet. No? Oh. Okay. We went to practice today, and I was standing, and Dave's like, you can't stand. And I was like, I have to stand. And he's like, you can't, because you have to talk in the microphone. So if I get up and walk away, it's because I needed to walk. So um, we're excited to be here. We thank you for your time, and we're excited to share um, just a few of the things that are going on um, at Miller, and we've got some rock star teachers. So obviously, I'm Kristen Kell, and... I'm Dave Glenn. And um, joining us tonight, um, you'll hear from them in just a little bit. You're, you get to hear from Dave and I first, and then the rock stars come in. So um, joining us today is Lauren Ward. She is a first-year special education teacher, and she joined us in January and has just hopped right in, feet first, and been doing a great job. Uh, oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, she co-teaches with Kathy Lang, who at last minute was unable to join us. So Lauren's going to carry the weight of our special ed um, co-teaching pair. And yeah, and then we also have Brett Comages, who is a longtime Miller social studies teacher, who is currently co-teaching with Angie Lovell, also a longtime Marshall <laughs> Marshalltown employee, but in her first year at Miller in a role as an ELL teacher. 
So they are co-teaching to provide language supports to students through social studies. So Dave and I, um, we really wanted to focus on um, our school improvement plan, which you have seen. So we shared our talking points. We're not going to go through those. And um, you've seen our school improvement plan. And that's really what we're basing um, our presentation on today, is that school improvement plan. And um, we'll go ahead and start with um, our PLCs and our team meetings. Right. So as I know you're all aware, you know, the PLC process in Marshalltown and how we want to, how to try to move that work forward. One of the things that I think is really important for, for our staff is that, you know, we have this dedicated time uh, throughout the week. They, now they have, each PLC has a dedicated meeting time throughout the week, but if that is interrupted or if they feel like they need more time, they have that common planning time every day. Uh, throughout the week so that they can work on that and they really want to focus on those big four questions of a PLC which are in a in a speedy nutshell what do we want kids to know how are we going to know when they know it what are we going to know when they don't learn it and then what are we going to do if they already have learned it so really we don't want any student to be sitting in class waiting patiently for others to catch up to where they are, nor do we want students to sit in class unable to access what everybody else is doing. And so as that part of that PLC, that's really the main focus is how do we get everybody access to what's happening in class and how do we have them all growing at, um, throughout that class period. Um, and then the other structure that we really have in place at a middle school, which is somewhat unique compared to some other schools, is that team process. So all of our 7th and 8th graders are split into three teams. So all of their teachers are shared on that team. So each team has about 140 to 150 kids in common. And so it really shrinks down that size of a class. So they really try to, to work on each of those kids and how do they get them what they need. Uh, part of that is every other week those teams meet and we dig into the data. We look at academic data. We look at behavior data. We look at anecdotal data from what's coming through the class. We look at attendance and we try to figure out, okay, if someone is not responding to what we're doing, how can we do that? And we design those interventions together collaboratively so that we hopefully are getting all students engaged. And you'll notice a big part of our um, school improvement was really focusing on that social emotional learning. And there's a lot of different avenues that we can go with that. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that all of our students have a trusted adult in the building. And we really focus on making sure everybody has a person. Um, we really encourage our students to get involved. And we want our teachers to make positive connections home, um, whether it be a phone call or an email or a postcard. And two kind of programs that we kind of have in place place is um, capturing kids hearts and PBIS and um, I realize that's really not uh, easy to see when it's on the big screen so I apologize for that we were trying to do bobcat colors um, so capturing kids hearts is kind of a process that's focused on that social emotional well-being it's really relationship driven um, and student connectedness which really goes back to that having that trusted adult. You know, we kind of believe if we can capture their hearts, we can impact our culture and we can start to see change. Um, each teacher with each class makes a social contract, and so the students are really involved in the decision making and the expectations for the class. And, you know, teachers go back to that, like, hey, are we really doing this right now? And that, so it's unique for each class. So every contract might be a little different because each class is a little different. Um, really focusing on connecting with students, being in the hallways, greeting kids by name when they walk in the door, um, really celebrating good things with them. Part of capturing kids' hearts is the Excel model. So it's engage, explore, communicate, empower, and launch. So that engage piece is good things. And so really celebrating the good things um, that kids did over the weekend that they did in their class before. Um, and just really focus on getting to know them through those good things and then launching them out, whether it's first block and we're launching them to second block or we're launching them at the end of the day to really focus on what did we do and how can I, hey, remember you've got three minutes before you head to that next class, go be awesome, and just um, connecting kids to that teacher and then launching them out to the next one. 
The other one that we do is PBIS, which I believe is district-wide, so that should sound familiar to you. So, um, you know, through PBIS, we really promote safety and good behavior. Um, we teach those expectations. So we always think of being a firefighter. We, we, we want to teach fire prevention, right, instead of fighting the fire head on. And so PBIS is kind of that fire prevention. We're, we're teaching those expectations. We're teaching kids, you know, the, the way that we want them to, to act. We, we, um, we, we, um, why am I just... Just all of our common expectations right. about how do we move through the building, how do we right. work things in class, how do we, how do we interact with each other. Absolutely. Um, and then, you know, we follow the CATS way, which is um, connected, accountable, tolerant, and safe. And so through PBIS, we award kids points for that, and we acknowledge them publicly. Like, Angie, I really appreciate you being here tonight. I know that you wanted to be home and your jammy is watching TV, and so I'm going to give you some, <laughs> some PBIS points for, you know, being accountable and being safe and being here you're not in your jammies and so we publicly acknowledge them so they know why they're getting their points and and we celebrate them in that little moment and then we have a PBIS store for students to use their points um, it's open during lunch and you know on the day-to-day -day, it's kind of little snacks or Hawkeye posters I think there's a few Iowa State ones down at the bottom that wow. the kids can grab <laughs> from um, and you know school supplies and things like that but then um, at the holiday time we have a holiday store and you guys, this was amazing. This year we had um, over 300 things that were donated from staff, from community, from, you know, Bath and Body Works packages to toys for kids to movie tickets, just things like that. Um, and so students could use their points to buy Christmas gifts um, for their families, for their friends, for themselves. Um, and we literally sold out every day that we had it, like in minutes. So it was pretty amazing and we had some pretty awesome things. Things. So kids really enjoy that. Um, we were walking through the hall, and I saw a kid with his package, and I was like, oh, what'd you get? And he was like, oh, I got something for my cousins. And then as he was walking away, he was like, thank you guys so much for doing this so I can get them a gift. And I was like, you're welcome. It was just really sweet, and it just, you know really showed us that purpose of it. Um, and then we this year we have combined kind of our student council and our PBIS kids team into kind of a PBIS student leadership, which Angie has actually helps with. And we really develop leaders with that through decision making. They own the school store. They plan and implement fun activities to build, you know, school culture and connectedness. And they also plan some community service. And so really an opportunity for some leaders to really shine um, at, and do it through kind of that that PBIS um, lens. Mm -hmm. All right, now on to the, uh, the other sides of things, which of course is why we're all officially here would be our achievement data. And if you can look on here, we've shared some of our uh, formative data that we're collecting three times a year through FAST. So we have A math and A reading scores. I'm going to share with you some of our seventh grade data. If you look on the, the very right-hand side, you'll see the benchmark or where we would expect all students to be. Um, and then the left-hand or the middle column would be where we were as an average for a seventh grade class. So um, in the fall, you could see we were just right at that benchmark, a little bit below. Um, in the winter, we're just a little bit above that benchmark. Um, not where we want to be. All right, we'll just be... Be honest with that. I mean, as you look at that average, so that's the middle score. That means we have a lot of kids that are below benchmark and a lot of kids that are above benchmark. And, and you know, we're, we're clearly not going to be happy until we have everybody above benchmark. One of the things that we're doing to help support that, uh, and we'll talk about the literacy side in a minute, but one of the things that was missing is we didn't have really a, a practice uh, opportunity for students during our building wide intervention time. So we approached uh, a couple of our math teachers last year to start developing what we call win math, which is there are a, a lot of ways for students to access math that's not just plug and chug of problems. All right, so there are some puzzles that they go through, some logic things that they go through. There's some problem solving opportunities for them to work on in their win class. Um, and it's really just an opportunity for them to think like mathematicians without saying do one through 20 odds, you know. And so um, one of those math teachers retired uh, that was working on that win math. And so we still have Alex Brimeyer, who is our seventh, one of our seventh grade math teachers, who is putting this together every week. He's doing that on his own time. And it's been 
um, a really a, a, a value add for for our, our, our students and and for Alex. Um, and then Brian Murphy, our uh, eighth grade instructional coach, is working on that same thing for he leads the eighth grade math PLC, so he's doing that for eighth graders. So that's that's where we're standing right now in in math. Hoping to see that number continue to rise as we move into our spring testing period. So then when we move to eighth grade again, it's just, you know, just kind of looking at those numbers, um, you know, because our instructional coach is kind of leading the PLC and does some of the win math, they've really honed in on this data and really trying to collect the data um, and really have the conversations and ha be reflective in this and what, you know, what can we do to help our kids and that win math is just something that focuses on the skills that they're doing right now and just like Mr. Glenn said, a different way. So it might be an escape room that they try to solve these problems to get out of or there's a contest with the teachers and they're working on the skills in math but it just looks so much different and so again you know we're, we we never want to you know be um, content until we can get you know all of our kids at benchmark and if you do look at our school improvement plan our, our true goal is for kids to make one year's growth um, you know and so you know obviously ultimately it is for them to be at benchmark but we also do want to celebrate those strides of kids that are making those that one year growth and so it's kind of a, a two a two-way street of how we look at that data it's you know meeting that benchmark being at grade level but then we also want to see them grow and obviously continue to grow to be at grade level. Hey, so does everybody do win math? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Except a, a very, uh, our very newest newcomers because they're working on language acquisition. Okay. So like eight kids don't, <laughs> everybody mm -hmm. else does. And they, we, it goes on A, B days. So A days are one and B days are what we're going to talk about for reading. So, yep. Okay. Yep. So A reading is the FAST assessment that measures our, our literacy growth. Um, again, same, same format for the table, so you can see where benchmark is, where, where our average scores were um, in the fall and the winter. Uh, it's a little bit behind on benchmark. I, I think that's not, that's not a surprise. Uh, if you look back historically, um, not, not okay. You know, we're not okay with that, and so we really are thinking about you know, one of the things that we talk about is that everybody in our building is a reading teacher at some level. And if you're not having kids read, you're not helping us move towards that goal. Mm -hmm. So everybody should be engaging in their reading throughout all of their classes throughout the day. Not just reading, but then what is that academic vocabulary that is tied to that reading that you're working on? And so we obviously we, we want to make all of that content accessible and sometimes making that that content accessible means putting it into common language um, putting some of those same vocabulary words those same terms into common language but then never losing sight of what that means and what that actual word is and where it is and so we're really working on that um, similar to a re a or to our win math excuse me we have a, a, a program through Lexia that students work through. They call it's called Power Up. If you've been familiar with the elementary version, it's Core Five, um, and the the next level up would be Power Up, and it's the middle school version of that Lexia reading program. Um, it's certain areas are more agreeable to students or students are more agreeable to certain areas of it and less agreeable to others. Grammar is usually the last set <laughs> that kids want to go through or that kids work their way through. Um, but really, that's the that's the goal for kids. And we tell them when you get through power up, you're through it. We're not going to say start over. We're not going to say go to another one. So once you've hit those achievements, you're up and then you've got you you get that time for what you need during when. Um, so if they need time to work on some assignments, they have that more, that a little bit more time throughout the day. And the, the exciting part for us is we're having more and more students come to us uh, as seventh graders having completed Power Up. So our part, so they're coming to us with that chunk already done. So they're working hard through, through Lenahan and when in Lenahan, when they finish Core 5, they move them right into Power Up. You know, so then they come to us and they say, well, I'm almost done with power up. And we're like, great, when you're done, you're done. Or some kids that say, I'm done, what's next? You know, they're waiting for the high school version. There isn't. <laughs> so they're, they're generally feeling pretty good about that. But uh, those are the kids that you can also say, great, 
we're really moving, now we can read. You know, not, I mean, the best way to improve in your reading is to read. Mm -hmm. So the more you read, the better you're going to get. And we, you know, we encourage kids to read to their siblings. I think one of the greatest things that ever worked for me personally on my fluency was having kids of my own and reading to them. <laughs> and when you start reading aloud all the time, it, you, you just, you get, you become a better reader. So that's one of the things that we work on in that sense. So then obviously just move into eighth grade data, much like Dave said, just, you know, just a little there. Um, so we moved up from winter, but again, we're still below that benchmark. So something that we continue to work on um, and eighth graders obviously work on Lexia as well. And again, again, across all content, you know, we're working on doing some type of reading throughout every, yep. um, every lesson that we can. Yep. Uh, our next piece that we want to talk about, it was something a little bit new this year. It was in the, We have these exploratory classes. So, you know, COVID brought some, a lot of challenges to us, and, you know, we're still fighting a lot of those challenges. But one of the things that it did, it provided us some opportunities to look at how we are doing things and how could we do them differently. And in our shift from a traditional, you know, seven-period day where kids are just going through this over and over and over, with this shift to an alternate day block schedule, um, <coughs> Was, has been really well received by students, I think, and most teachers alike. It's, you have more energy at the end of the day. You're only going to four classes a day for kids instead of eight or seven, and, and they have more energy at the end of the day. They're able to engage for a longer period of time throughout the day. The downside is that we ended up with a lot of holes in kids' schedules <laughs> because we essentially made a seven-period day an eight-period day. And so we had a lot of kids with open spots. And, and Chris and I, one of the things that we, one of the first conversations we had is we're not doing study hall. And she's like, oh, good. You know, because <laughs> we were both in, in, in totally in line with that. And, you know, you think about a middle school kid with a 76 minute study hall, that's not going to be a good combination, <laughs> right? One, that's a lot of instructional time that could be used for instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most middle school kids aren't going to use uh, that study hall to, to work on, on their coursework, uh, it, they, especially in a group, right? And, and they're not going to be the one kid out of 28 who's, who's uh, studying during study hall and everybody else is on their phone. So we had to find something to do. So we started with a survey to kids at Lenahan and say, what are you interested in? What, would you, what do you want to learn more about? We took those results, shared it with our staff and said, okay, here's what kids are really interested in. What would you be willing to teach? And so they developed some courses that are around these interest areas, and kids have been scheduled into those exploratory classes throughout the year. Um, and as we think and, and, and try to move this forward, one of the things that we're going to do is connect these uh, exploratory classes to the career trees that are being developed at the high school. And as we really work on that high school ready, um, hopefully we will have students with a better understanding of, is this a career area, a tree that I'm interested in hanging under? Um, and it should lead them as they start to develop their four-year plans and think about what am I gonna do in high school? What elective courses am I gonna take? You know, are there college or career technical classes that I need to be focused on? Um, they will have had some exposure through some of our exploratory classes to get into, into some of those. We've had things from, well, what started as an intro to automotive, and then we realized that's not a semester long class, turned into kind of an intro to construction, and, and one of our teachers is running that, and the kids are building. We've got, if you come by Miller and you see the south side of the building, we've got three picnic tables that the kids built, but we're gonna, now that hopefully the weather's getting nicer when we come out to lunch, they can have some kids that can go and eat out at the picnic tables instead of being stuck inside. Um, Brett has like a military history, which uh, is kind of his passion, but kind of a little different twist. Um, Lauren has creative endeavors, which, you know, it's just what ups. But, you know, so it, just a lot of different options. Mo right. mo most kids got what they wanted. You know, some kids, it was just a nature of the beast of how their schedule fell. So, you know, not everybody in book club loves book club. I said, but so you're interested in book club? No. We are not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for the most part, I think we've done a good yeah. job of getting, or at least where they got that they felt, you know, it was interesting to them. Yeah, it, it's, it's, been, it's been interesting. It's been a challenge. I mean, our teachers have really risen to the, to the occasion to, you know, develop these courses. We didn't just spring it on them in August. That We knew about it last spring, and they had an opportunity to think about what do they want that to look like? How do we want kids to be able to access this? And, 
You know, and it's kind of an opportunity for some of our teachers, for kids to see their teachers in a different light. So mm -hmm. I might be a math teacher teaching, or I might be a social studies teacher teaching military history and leadership. And generally throughout the year, students of Mr. Kamaji's know his military background. And that becomes a part of their course. But we have a lot of students then who also get to experience that and that passion and the impact that it's had on his life who weren't rostered to him as, as a social studies teacher. So it's a little bit bigger impact, a little bit more of a, a reach to and We, to we didn't students. talk about this, but just something to, to note that every exploratory class is tied to standards. Um, a lot yeah. of them 21st century standards, a lot of them, you know, book club, history of sports, history of um, the military, those tied directly to, to some content standards. So each course has standards that it's tied to, and, and, and it is a graded course, mm -hmm. just like related arts or um, CTE courses at the high school. So each course is a semester long? Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. For 70 some minutes mm -hmm. at a shot. Every other day. Every other day. Yep. Yep. And like jazz band is an exploratory, so it doesn't happen before school anymore. It happens during school. It awesome. opens up access to kids who awesome. didn't have transportation yep. to school Absolutely. for Grace. early morning jazz band. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, so the next thing, it kind of leads to, you know, um, sharing the good things. And um, when it, Dave and I came on to Miller, this was something that we really talked a lot about. There was kind of a narrative of, about Miller that had been created um, without maybe um, some true fact to it. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were sharing the good. Um, and when we share the good, we get to make the narrative um, at Miller. And, and you know, it, it's not always rainbows and unicorns. And I think we're honest with that as well. Um, we, we do have rainbow and unicorn moments that we really want to share with families and the community. So a couple ways that we do that is we have Cats Kids of the Day. Um, and this was something in place, um, you know, prior to Dave and I kind of taking the reins, but we've really kind of honed in on it and really tried to make it. Um, and it's kind of Cats Kids of the Day or, or the week. <laughs> depending. Um, we used to do it during our lunch time, but now that we all have lunch duty, it doesn't work. So we're kind of tra trying to change our time when we do it. But teachers nominate students who exemplify that cat's way. So they're connected or they're accountable, they're tolerant and safe. And we read their names aloud on the loudspeaker and we call home to parents, um, which is, it, it is the best part of our day. Yeah. Anytime we get down. to do that, um, you know, some kids like to play with their parents and be like, pretend that I'm in trouble. And then other kids are like, tell them it's good, like right away. <laughs> um, but it, it, it really, it, it's just a fun time. It's a way for us to connect with kids, but it's also a way for us to connect with parents. And um, you, I could, we could probably count on, on um, fingers and toes how many parents have cried when we've called. And it just, it's really great. Um, and then we post their pictures on social media um, and just celebrate them. Um, uh, the other thing that we started um, is the Family Miller Minute. Um, prior to um, me joining, um, Dave did a Miller Minute, which is our weekly um, correspondence with um, our teachers and our staff. And he had the idea to kind of come up with this family Miller Minute. And obviously last year doing COVID and hybrid and everything in between, we really needed to communicate with parents. Um, and so we created this family Miller Minute. It has kind of evolved into kind of bi-monthly. We kind of do it twice a month. And, you know, if there's something that we need to share, we obviously do it. Um, you know, we update parents on what's happening at Miller and, and we really try to keep those lines of communication open. But we also try to, you know, we share the good but we also want to be honest, you know, um, when we came out of hybrid, when, you know, we were, every, you know, kids were coming every two days. And when we came back all together, you know, it was a rough couple weeks. And we shared that with parents. We wanted to be honest. So, you know, these are some things that are going on. These are the things that we're doing. Um, you know, we, I, I think we're pretty proud of ourselves. You know, we kind of attacked the TikTok challenge pretty early on with a newsletter to our parents and, you know, said this is what's happening. And, you know, um, I, I think it, it really, it, it was short-lived um, at Miller because we just were honest with parents and said, this is what's happening. Please talk to your kids about this. And, um, you know, it, it ended pretty pretty quickly. So um, the Family Miller Minute is just a way for us to communicate with parents, whether it's sporting events, you know, seasons coming up or um, concerts coming up and just, you know, sharing whatever we can. And then, like we said, anytime that we can share the good on social media, on Remind, or um, via email is really important to us to show the good things that our teachers and our staff are doing. Kristen, how's your newsletter shared with parents? It is shared on Twitter, Facebook, and then through Infinite Campus. Okay. 
And it, it is in English and Spanish. Thank you. All right, so the real reason <laughs> we're all up here tonight, and, you know, it's funny, you give Kristen and I a microphone, you, you know, we could be never here know. until 9 o'clock, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> Um, but we'd like to turn it over to, to, to Lauren, Angie, and Brett, and so they can talk a little bit about their experience as, as co-teaching pairs. Well, I mean, Lauren, a co-teaching pair person. Um, but, but really, it's, uh, you know, it's a real testament to Lauren wanting to show up here as, as a, a brand new teacher, been on the job for three months now, almost three months. Um, <laughs> You know, I came in and said, well, what am I going to do? Well, you're going to work with this person <laughs> all day. And she's like, okay. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, I think, so if we want to give them an opportunity to talk about just kind of their experience and the benefits to, to kids, really, because that's why, we're, that's why we are going down this road, and that's why we're so, so passionate about it, making it work. So I don't know who wants to start. Lauren, start? I can start. Oh, Let wow. me grab my notes. I can't. You guys memorize a lot, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm Lauren Ward. Um, I co-teach with Kathy Lang. She is not here. Um, but basically, the things that I just want to talk about, I'd never been, actually, I'd been at one school that I co-taught in my college experience, but it was nothing like this. And so I love this. Um, I love the planning time with the PLCs. You know, I think that that really makes it generalized between all of the um, department. So like the ELA department, you know, I get to work with another special education teacher. Um, and that helps me a lot since I'm a first year. Um, you know, we share different resources with each other for modifications for higher and lower differentiation. Um, so that's really beneficial. Um, I really like the fact that when I'm in the classroom, I am also a teacher, right? The kids don't see me as a special education teacher. Honestly, mm -hmm. very few of them probably know that that is what my title is, and that's what co-teaching should be to me. Um, I'm there for the students with IEPs and 504s, but I'm not just there for them, right? If you see a student struggling, you know, okay, let me pull you out to provide support in a different way. Um, not only can I provide support in the co-teaching gen ed classroom, but then I can also provide support during the win time. Um, so like we talked about, we have our reading and math interventions during win time, but my students in my room um, are on my IEP roster. So then I could say, hey, I know in ELA you're really struggling with this, so let's work on that together now in order to increase your chances of success in the classroom. Um, I also like the fact that when I'm in the classroom, you know, before I had always seen pull out methods where you talk to the gen ed teacher and you say, okay, these are the accommodations and modifications that this student needs in your classroom, but you never see those done very rarely. Um, so I like the fact that I am able to come in and say, these are what these students need. What have you been doing? What can I help do? Um, it holds both of us accountable to make sure that each student is achieving what they, their version of success is. You know, every student is different, and I truly, truly believe that with the supports that we are providing through co-teaching, we are able to just not provide one definition of success, but one for each, every student. Um, Kathy wanted me to read. <laughs> she wrote. Um, she just said, I love being a co-teacher. First, on the day-to-day -day side, there's an extra set of ears and eyes to not only help with classroom management, but to also make sure all the students are understanding. On a deeper level, it is amazing to have someone to bounce ideas off of, both for planning and those quick in-the-moment decisions. Having two people to brainstorm on how to solve a problem when weeks or days is crazy is the best. The kids get more one-on-one -on -one and more thought and expertise goes into each lesson to make sure each student is getting what they need in order to succeed. So I really, really love our program. I love our time to spend in our PLCs collaborating. So I've really enjoyed it. Well, I don't speak as fast as any of these people. <laughs> and I'm not real happy about following those speech kids because they were really good. Um, you know, I've been in a couple different co-teaching models throughout the years, and, and I've been with the district for 11 or 12 years, and I've been teaching over 20. And, and it's really hard for me to separate the co-teaching model from the co-teacher I work with. Because I work with Angie, and I, I just I don't have enough good things to say about her. It almost gives me goosebumps. Because really, when you walk into these situations, it's almost transformative when you have somebody who's a positive person, who wants to teach, who wants to learn just like you do. And, you know, I'm a 50 years old. You think I'd be, I'd be 
you know, pulling back a little bit and just trying to coast, but I'm really, I'm learning new things every day. Mm-hmm. You know, Angie come to me, she came to me about two months ago and she said, Hey, you should, you should try doodle notes. I said, yeah, sure. Good idea. Well, what are they? <laughs> and she said, Oh, you could do this and you like to draw and you like to do, you know, you know, your content. I said, that's fantastic. Let's do it. You know, let's try it tomorrow. And she says, great. She said, you can even use the hue hue projector. I said, that's awesome. What's, what's that? <laughs> and she said, that's that red thing on your desk. I said, man, I thought that was a microphone. It's been sitting there for two years. I thought people were bugging my room. <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm, I'm within five minutes, I'm using it, using Screencastify videos. And it's like, it's like almost like when the caveman discovered fire. <laughs> and it's, but it's, it's those little, yeah, well, I mean, I, I play dumb, I guess. It lowers <laughs> expectations. But, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make is, though, when you, those discoveries happen every day when you get to work in that kind of collaborative model with somebody. And it's a rare opportunity you get. When I first started teaching, it was all about autonomy. That was one of the big selling points. You know, you don't get paid much, but hey, nobody messes with you. You're in your own room and, and you get to do your thing. And now as we've progressed in education, you know, you're no longer a social studies teacher. You're a school counselor. You're the um, you're the ELL teacher, you're a special ed teacher, you are you are pretty much everything all in one, you're a behavior interventionist all at once. And to be able to be in relationships and collaborative models that allow you to grow as an individual, that's essential if we want to continue serving, servicing these kids because there are so many needs. And just this, this one little suggestion she gave me one day has transformed the way I teach on a daily basis. And, and I, I think we're doing things in that classroom that are helping kids not just this year, but are going to help them later on, helping them build connections, helping them exercise both sides of their brains so we could be more efficient and, 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 and have higher order thinking skills developed. There's just so many different things that come from this collaboration that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have Angie in my room. So in a way, this is the best resource this district's ever gave me. Um, that's going to be tougher to follow next year. I'm not sure what she's going to do for me next year, but <laughs> but we, we are progressing. We're growing. And, a list. And, yeah. <laughs> Every day she's got something. Um, and she's even getting me to drink vitamin C, which is the biggest. <laughs> That's a big one. We have short, shortage of subs. Comes in just those, two, those packets on my desk to drink this. Drink this. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, my tennis has gotten better. You know, I, I do have one here. This is something we actually built today, and, and this is, you know, we actually, I, even the kids, we, I, I'm a, I think we've kind of lost some connections with um, a lot of things. In um, well, these computers are great; they give instant access to information, and and, and but you you really you lose some spatial reasoning skills. I think kids. Yeah. Because they get overwhelmed access to information, they don't make connections to information. They just regurgitate what they see. So this this is much more hands on what we're trying to do. And even we'll just start off with a class with a little origami assignment where they have to actually build and create their model, and then we will trace the lines and we'll we'll create make connections for them. And and they're building these things and designing them as we go, and we're having discussions, and they'll stop and have reflections in between. And it's just, it's really been a, a good thing because, like I said, your one side of your brain handles all the logic and the reasoning and the reading and the writing, and the other side handles the visuals and the colors and, and, and the imagery and the creativity and the spatial reasoning. And when one is working, the other may not be, but if you can get them working at the same time, the idea is it's, it's like your engine, and you don't want only half your engine running. You know, you want the whole thing going. And if we can impact the brain like that, uh, I think we're going to have more effective teaching, we're going to have more effective learning, we're going to have um, just more progress. And so it's been exciting for me, and I think it's been a good collaboration, and I, I appreciate the fact that I've had the opportunity to work with her. So. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say now, no. Um, just to, uh, everything that they've said, just to piggyback off of that, you know, coming into a new position with, I was more intermediate, so sixth grade, and I've taught for, well, this is like my 22nd year, and 18 of those have been reading. And so, you know, taking all the things that the district has taught me over those years from um, differentiated learning to brain compatible curriculum to all these strategies, and for me to be in, I, I teach, I co teach in seventh grade and eighth grade, and then I push into a science class. And just to see the great things that these other teachers are doing and being able to say, hey, you know, 
Mrs. Edel does screencastifies. It really helps students. They can go back and they can rewatch these. She can differentiate in her classroom, you know, for those kids that are absent or the ones that are at home or the ones that have high anxiety that need to see it over and over again, you know, you know, then taking that back to Brett and saying, this has been successful in another classroom. Do you want to give it a try? And, of course, we had to go through the computer stuff, you know, but he is a quick learner. And he's taught right <laughs> off. Um, you know, but just to take that, the kids are so consumed by that technology all day long that it's really hard sometimes to make this tough curriculum in eighth grade and seventh grade um, comprehensible because I know that they have not seen this type of content K-6. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, oh my gosh, now they're talking about this, I'm like, oh, we never talked about that at all, you know. Um, it's all new. So coming up with ways to make it exciting and um, engaging, you know, yes, do we have a few kids that are not engaged? Yes. But the kids that we couldn't get engaged before are excited, and they're here, and they're um, they're participating. They're raising their hands. They're asking really good questions. And I think that's the goal. And I think co-teaching is really valuable. Um, you know, part of the reason I did go to Miller, I have had my yellow endorsement for a long time, is I wanted to co-teach and not do pull-out because there's so much value. And, gosh, I get to see so many kids a day. So, you know, building those relationships is also huge. And then it all connects back to those questions with our PLC, which is very important when we are planning. So, you know, to get to the point where we take our strengths and we are able to share them. So Abel's, you know, Brett is a very gifted artist. I mean, to be able to point out, hey, you have a really a gift for this. Have you ever thought about this? Um, you know, to share those sources in a different way, I just think is very powerful for, for us to be motivated as educators and for kids to see, yeah, we're really trying to help them learn. So and it's been we, a great and if experience. If we can find engaging activities for these kids, we can help build stamina because all these kids don't have stamina right. to sit in the classroom for any, any length of period. Um, so it's been great in, in that case. And I will say, she made a comment about my technology skills, which they aren't as bad as I make them out to be. <laughs> no. But I, I'm, I'd like to say I couldn't spell YouTube before Angie, but I, I, I could. But I, I've actually, I've got a, I just, over the weekend or spring break, I, instead of on vacation, I, I actually made a YouTube channel and I've got screencast by videos I'm downloading. So now if I'm not there or I'm, I actually told the kids today, I said, listen, if you subscribe to this, I'll put videos that you're going to need in high school. We'll talk about the law, put electoral college stuff on there. I'll put stuff about World War II. We'll put stuff about, um, um, you know, all, government, whatever you need, three branches of government, we'll just keep growing and growing and growing with it. So when they get older, maybe if they're having struggles with these language acquisition or maybe with the teaching styles they've got, they can go back to these things and they can say, hey, <laughs> or send me an email. I'll add something else on there. I'll do it. I mean, I'm, I don't have a social life anymore. I'll just <laughs> all day, you know. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's a resource I'm hoping will grow and continue on so these kids, they just won't walk away from Miller and say, hey, that was, you know, one and done. Now they can, you know, we're, we're going to build something that's a, a larger framework is what I'm hoping for. You know, teaching is really hard right now, and we know that with everything that's gone on. And if we can support each other and um, point out each other's, you know, positive things and what we're good at, I think we can motivate each other, you know, try to get that passion for teaching back. And I think that's everybody's job in the building. And, um being new, that's kind of the the role I've really tried to embrace, and you know, just to share. Let's let's, let's get this done. We can do it. You know, we got to keep at it. This too shall pass. You know. So anyway, do you guys have any questions for them, or can we release them? <laughs> I guess the question I have the question I have is uh, I don't know my verbiage. Chromecast or you. Shoot, is that you're recording yourself doing a lecture, and then the kids can go back and you look know, at it? I, I'm. It's like Bob Ross, only history. Okay, right. gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, you, all they see is my hands, which is probably lucky for them. Um, so, are you getting paid by YouTube yet? Uh, get enough hits, or no? Yet. Okay, I've never seen a check. Let's put yeah. it that way. 
Can't get paid with 36 subscribers, I don't think. <laughs> 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 oh. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's a video. They physically watch, and I'll be walking through it and talking. And, and you can actually create interactive <laughs> questions, and, and, and I haven't. Um, that's a little advanced for me. But um, but you'll go through, and you'll you'll create these things. And in class, typically, we've got a project on the board, and they're following along with me. They're creating with me. Okay. And then we'll take breaks and stops. And the Angie, So all these maps that you've got, they've all got a copy of that map. And they just have to start adding in the information. And this is, if you have traditional notes, you're just standing up there writing stuff down mm-hmm. like that. You know, I went back and visited my eighth grade social studies teacher 10 years after I, I graduated high school. And I remember looking at the, the overhead. He had an overhead. <laughs> and it was the exact overhead that I had. And I said, Essling, that's the exact same notes I had. He said, oh, yeah, I know. I said, no, no, that's the exact same paper. I remember seeing that plastic stain on there and, he, and it was so I mean but this is interactive the kids are creating as they're doing it mm-hmm. and so I, I literally five classes I'm, I'm making the exact same map for every single one of them it's just that I I after school I'll just make one video with nobody around and then I post that so if the kids aren't there for a day they can literally pull up that video and watch yeah. what we did in class maybe at a little faster pace a little less interaction mm-hmm. but they've got the same lesson they would have had in the room at the time if they had been there it's great. So your co-teaching setup, it kind of sounds to me like your PLCs. Mm-hmm. You've got your groups established. Do you have identified co-teaching um, situations in each PLC? So do all students have access to co-teaching? So not all of our courses are co-taught. Okay. Um, we just don't have that, that mm-hmm. amount of staff. But exactly. So we, are co-te- we co-teach in... Math and ELA, mm-hmm. and, and that's specifically for entitled students. Mm-hmm. Um, so those that have goal areas in math mm-hmm. and science, or math and or reading mm-hmm. or writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes then we will target some other kids that may not be entitled, but we know they're really struggling, like they really could benefit mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. having a couple of. But we also try to keep that ratio so that it's not so that course doesn't become unrecognizable as a gen ed course. And so, you know, try to keep that around no more than a third of that course would be entitled students. Okay. Students. And then social studies is where we're getting all of our language support for our mm-hmm. English language learners. Okay. So is it every section in every one of those areas? It is not. Um, and so some students are cross-teamed uh, because of that. So they might be on the B team, but they need a co-taught ELA class. And during that time, it's only on an A team. So, mm-hmm. you know, they might have that that cross team aspect but Mm -hmm. if uh if the board would would approve us hiring more specialists to co-teach in Mm -hmm. every section Mm -hmm. we would be down for that (laughs) well it sounds like you've honed in what co-teaching should really be we really kudos we really want to focus on that three-pronged approach to co-teaching so really it's co-planning co-teaching and Mm co-assessing and all three of those things need to be in place so in other words both of those teachers the specialist and the the classroom teacher are involved in the planning of the lessons and what kids are going to need they're involved in the teaching of the lesson Mm -hmm. no one is standing off to the side Mm -hmm. just I'm here when you're ready you know they jump in and they have certain areas where they say well this is really a strength area for you why don't you teach this part when we get to it Mm -hmm. because you're the expert in this area Mm -hmm. and then I can I can move around and make sure kids are working Mm -hmm. and then that third prong is the co-assessing part it's never one person's responsibility to do any of that we really are trying to focus on the, the shared responsibility for that entire group of kids so co-teachers have the same planning time every day yes Mm -hmm. awesome yeah everyday planning time with plc really makes that much more powerful Mm -hmm. i can see where Mm -hmm. that could well and and the reality i mean so sometimes i mean not all of brett's classes are co-taught but i know he's able to take some of those same ideas and things that were successful when Angie was with him. Residual impact. Yeah, and then apply that when he is by himself. Mm -hmm. You know, some of those same things are happening. So it's really, really beneficial. Mm -hmm. This isn't about co-teaching, but I loved hearing that every teacher is a reading teacher. And so my question is... um, Angie, you've got a lot of background in, in reading. Um, I hope that uh, these guys are using your expertise in PD because, you know, as far as um, I taught in middle school and, you know, I, it becomes content-oriented. 
And you really need to teach those reading strategies to teachers for them to implement the strategies in their content area with kids. And that's that. the best way to teach reading, especially at that middle school level. So I'm hoping that your PD includes a lot of reading strategies, how to embed it in that content. When I was teaching at the college, Angie, and I taught reading in the content area, you know, I, I get these students in, and they're at the very end of their college experience, and they have to take this class for their endorsement. And they're saying, well, why do we have to take this? And I grumble, grumble on the first day. We get to the end of the class, and they say, we wish we'd taken this class before we went to college. <laughs> I have one last question, then I'll shut up. Um, intervention time that you guys talked about. Are students grouped at all according to skill deficit areas so that it can be maximized, instruction can be maximized? Only for the identified. All identified students are with their case managers, and then all ELL students are with ELL teachers. Beyond that, it, there's, it's, it's more random. But we do, it is common across the building. Right. So They're doing the same have the things. the ability to move, <clears throat> right? So if Brett needs three or four kids and they're scattered throughout, he can pull them into his room during that intervention time and maybe farm a couple of his out to them so it's not an overwhelming number of kids. The other advantage is there are a couple of PLCs that have started to do that kind of work collaboratively. So they'll think about, they'll think about all of their mm -hmm. students exactly. and say, I'm gonna take this group of kids mm -hmm. who need remediation. You're gonna take this group of kids who need some extension and you're gonna take the kids in yep. the middle. Yeah. You know, and so whether you have them in class or not, exactly. the whole idea is getting them what they need. Exactly. Which is yeah. why we call it wind time. You hone it down yep. and you pinpoint the strategy. Great. Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing that we wanted to chat about was co-principalship. Um, we had an interview today and the, the gal was like, what, what is this? How? how <laughs> What is this How does this, How does this work? Really like, in who's in charge? <laughs> and we're like, well, we both are. So, um, you know, it, it really has worked in the last two years, and we share responsibilities and we share accountability, and um, we have a strong collaborative partnership. Our communication is is on par, and we learned very early on that communication was the key. Um, and I think our teachers learned early on that we communicate. And so, if they ask Dave, Dave will text me within two seconds and be like, "Angie's coming to you. She's asking for this. I've already told her no." And so, by the time <laughs> Angie gets to me, she realized, you know, so it's like the first couple weeks they did that and we really haven't had that sense. You know, now sometimes they'll come and they'll be like, oh, hey, can we do this? And I'm like, well, let me check. And they're like, yeah, you got to check with Dan. And so then Dave and I will discuss it. And um, so it is really collaborative. Um, and, you know, it, it is that communication piece. Um, and we capitalize on each other's strengths. We each bring something else to the table. Um, you know, I, I have learned a lot from, from Dave, and he's got just some really great qualities in working with students and working with parents. And so while technically I'm the 8th grade principal and Dave is the 7th grade principal, it's very fluid. Um, the only time that you would ever know that's who we are is when we do team meetings because I work with 8th grade team and he works with 7th grade team. But, you know, students come into the office, it's whoever they find. And sometimes Dave works better with students and sometimes I work better with students. And, um, you know, so we just capitalize on each other's strengths and, and how we um, move throughout the day. Um, and, and we're just a team and I think we make a really great team. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the only thing that I would really add to that is just the ability to support each other without, you know, there, there's not ever this, okay, well, at this point, I'm going to have to defer because Kristen's really in charge. <laughs> you know, we're, we're together and we work things and we will, we will sit and we will chew through any kind of issue that's going on until we have something that we both feel good about. Um, and, and like Kristen said, we bring different experiences. The majority of my career, although I had a little high school, it has been at a middle school level. Kristen's majority of her career was at the high school level. Those are completely different perspectives. But when we think about how our ultimate goal is to prepare kids to be successful at the high school, it's really nice to have the, all of that background and expertise that Kristen has when we think about the structures and you know, those pieces that, are gonna, that kids are really gonna need to be able to, to demonstrate to have that success 
Um, and and we, we do. We just, we, we spend a lot of time uh, all, all day long talking and often late into the night, you know, talking about whatever was going on and, and how to support each other in that sense. And, and we're very, very appreciative for that opportunity. So we appreciate the, the board's willingness when this came up a couple of years ago to take that recommendation and, and, and allow it because it's been, we think it's been a really good thing for Miller. Yeah. And better than I think we both thought it would ever go. <laughs> Neither of us knew what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there other questions or comments from anybody? I think the comment I guess I'd have, nothing to do with this, but um, I like your skits you put on Facebook. <laughs> I, where do you get the, where do you get the... Kristen's the, the ideal person. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. yeah, whatever. The, the, <laughs> I'm willing to look silly. He's willing to come up with the idea. Yeah, I'm a, we're, yeah. we're really, really... I love the positivity. It's it's nice, and, and it's great for the families, the grandparents, parents to see that. Um, but I was moved uh, a couple months ago as a high V. I had a citizen come up to me and says, do you know what they're doing at Miller School? I said, oh, I don't know what. They're, they went on, I think, Saturdays. You had kids come in on a Saturday to do like a can drive or a food drive, some type of drive. Yes, that was for pop for, for pops. pops. Yep, that was through PBIS leadership. Yeah. Yep. And I tell you what, um, it's it's proud to see that we're, we're turning them into good citizens, mm -hmm. community-minded kids, and that was great to hear from citizens like that. Yeah. Half those cans came from my room. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a little competition going on? <laughs> and, and Brett, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate the fact that when Angie goes into your room and makes a suggestion, that you're willing to work with her. I, I don't realize you, if you realize how wonderful that is for her, that she can make a suggestion and you're willing to at least try it. <laughs> so thank you. I'm pretty wonderful. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I should make a comment about that, too. I, I think a, a, a co-teaching model is only going to be effective Absolutely. if you have willing partners. I mean, they've got to want to be collaborative. They want to be open. They've got to, and not all teachers have that mindset, exactly. and that's something that takes time, but it also takes an assertive co-teacher to walk into a room because you're walking into somebody else's territory. I mean, this oh, is, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an intimidating thing for most people, and, and me personally, I have a way of, I get my mind on something. I kind of run right over things, and... Angie's, you know, putting her foot out, tripped me up, saying, well, well, wait a second. But it, almost immediately, the, the, the connection was there, and I, like I said, it's been a really good thing for me. Um, and hopefully she's gotten something out of it, too. I know she's always writing down notes. I didn't know that. <laughs> and that's a real testament to Lauren, too, down here. I mean, as you think about that, like starting your career halfway through a school mm -hmm. year, being placed into a classroom with a veteran teacher and still being able to push that practice. And Lauren has done that, not just with her co-teacher, but with the entire special ed department. And um, <clears throat> she has, that we have another, someone who, who joined with her, uh, Rebecca Zattern, who joined with her at the same time, also a special ed teacher. Uh, and the two of them have kind of become the dynamic duo of the new, a new way of looking at things. And so it's been, I think just that level I think it's it's important for people to feel that level of support. In a lot of ways, co-teaching is an arranged marriage, um, <laughs> but it still has to work, mm -hmm. right? And even if your marriage isn't arranged, if you went in thinking it's going to be, you know, sunshine every single day, you, you quickly realize that that's not the case, and you have to put in the work. Mm -hmm. And our co-teaching pairs are putting in the work mm -hmm. to make it work, and that's probably the most yeah. exciting part. Any other questions for us? I don't think they'll invite us back for a long no, probably time. Not. So you're supposed to talk for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we did okay. Dead on. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Have a great you. night, guys. Thanks okay. for your time. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Justin? Yeah, exactly. So I've asked uh, Justin and Todd to come talk about an upcoming project that we'd like to go out to 
get some pe competitive quotes for a fisher with a walking track. Yeah, you know, uh, a few months back, we <coughs> asked for the approval to have Justin Sorensen with TSP see if he could develop and design a walking path for Fisher, similar to what we installed over at Rogers five years ago, possibly. Um, Justin, during that time, after the approval has went, this is early renditions of what we would be looking for at that space. Um, kind of give you a good idea of that setup that would fall over on the southwest corner of the building. They have that large green space mm. that would be along 12th Ave Avenue? Sixth. 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 Sixth Street yeah. uh, over there um, and lay it out right in there. Uh, part of the design I had asked from, if Amy can pan down a little bit, or uh, sorry, up a little bit, uh, you'll notice kind of that bluish color coming that would be a stairway from the upper playground to transition down to the other they do have a um, <coughs> handicap ramp along the one side that connects the two but during this process we was looking at that that's a pretty steep hill and we was always having washout and mm. problems and everything else so we thought that would be a good solution to give another access point for people to get down to the actual walking path. Yeah, so similar to what we did at Rogers, it's a nine foot wide walking track. This one's a, close to the same size. We adjusted the dimensions a little bit to get it to fit this site better. Um, so we're going along the two fence lines um, in the southwest corner. And we'll be taking out that, that the existing backstop um, and repairing the fence along that behind there just to to close that off because the backstop acts as part of the fence line there um, and adding a gate there to to control access a little bit um, inside the track will all be grass so it'll be essentially become another uh, framed out play field so for PE or for recess they can do specific activities in kind of in kind of a little field um, as he said along the the retaining wall that was put in during the Fisher expansion i um, going to put in stairs and a handrail there that will connect down to the walking track. Um, part of that blue um, line connecting to the red track also just connects to the sidewalk that goes around the um, soft surface playground that's there now. Um, and then we're also respecting the um, storm sewer line that cuts through. You can see it going at an angle from the street and then going straight north. Um, there's an area intake there. Um, which kind of makes a little bit of a goofy jog in the as the stair comes down and goes over to that. Um, so we're bidding it. Uh, the base bid is just for the track, um, and then the, the sidewalk connecting to the playground. Um, we'll bid the stairs with the handrail as an alternate. Um, and then also there's an alternate to replace the backstop and push it north of the new track so that there's still a, a backstop for PE and recess to do kickball and other activities. Um, on that site um, and not disturb other activities that may be going on at the track at the same time. Are there questions? So it's not, it's, is it going from fence all the way to fence or is it from the picture halfway? It's, it's if you go down to the, the bottom right of the page, you can see the full site right there. Yeah. So I mean, it's right in the corner of the two fence lines on right. 6th and Pleasant View. Yeah. Um, but then you still got the whole, the whole grass lot all the way to the, the properties to the north that would be just general, general play field. Um, and we're not going to be changing the grade of any, anything, so this isn't going to be perfectly flat. Um, just to save costs, we're just going to match the existing grades of that grass area um, so that we don't have to try to flatten that out and have additional cost for grading is it like a quarter mile what how, how, how big's the track i didn't check the 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 distance i mean the inside dimensions are 90 by 145 for that inside grass lot and then it's a nine foot wide track so i don't can't do the calculation in my head quick enough to know what the length of the track is but 
Um, the other question I had is it just more or less cost restricted. We're not going all the way to that corner and around. What's the why, why halfway and oh, around? Actually, what you would see there is where the fence is now because you have that tree line that runs all the way down through there. Okay. There's the sidewalk okay. and then how the tree line runs. So it was just to match the initial fenced off perimeter we had. Okay. Do we own the land behind the tree line? That Back up to the north of that? Yeah. To, to, um, yeah. South. to the south. To the south. <clears throat> or to the south of it? Yeah. South be the west. It'll be the yeah. north. I mean, north is up. North, yes. So, I mean, all that, yes. That's, that's all playground. current play. Playground. That's where the playground You're is. You're just trying. We didn't okay. want to completely grass. encircle everything and restrict the use of that grass lot as much so we, we tried to match the same size that we have at rogers and this is pretty close to this the, the dimensions are a little bit different but the overall length of the walking track should be the same but that leaves the majority of that um, grass play area for larger kickball activities and instead of trying to do those activities inside a walking track and if there's kids trying to reese or yeah, recess, trying to walk or do something, they're not getting balls kicked at them. So it's trying to separate activities a little bit and we and not go across the whole grass area. Okay. What's the cost estimate for this? Do you have one? Um, my cost estimate for the base bid for the track and the, the connection to the sidewalk is $45,250. Um, and my estimate for the Alternate one, which is the stairs, is thirteen thousand, and then the alternate two for the new backstop is forty eight hundred. So close to sixty. Close sixty ish. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's. I mean, it's kind of tough to estimate stuff right now with the bid market, but that's um, using our internal cost estimator in our Sioux Falls office um, from recent projects, and then also in Rochester working with some some contractors up there on some other projects doing preliminary estimates. Um, using what they're what they're budgeting right now for sidewalks and, and stairs and fencing is what we use to to base this off of and a lot of the prices are up 20 to 30 percent from two years ago but and who knows where they're going to be by summer so and um, <clears throat> this would come in at a cost even though there may be elevated expenses significantly less than what it costs to do rogers because we did have significant groundwork we had to do there just because of the fact that the field was over former properties right. yeah. homes that had been raised and then we also had to create fencing around that facility whereas we're just using the existing fence that that already is at Fisher. Right. And then on this project, we, we, on that project, since it, yeah, that was a reclaimed lot after demoing four houses, there was a lot more site grading, um, a lot more seating for the whole interior of the track where this, um, as they cut in the track, they'll only be reseeding two to three feet on each side or whatever they damage, not that whole internal section. So we're, we're not going to have as much cost there. Um, and there were a lot more utility connections and, and trenches that we had to do at Rogers as yeah. well to, to get all the services through. So, yeah. Any other questions? If not, is there a motion to approve the Fisher Elementary walking track drawings and the quote slash bid form as presented? So moved. Second. McGinnis Hernandez, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries 7-0. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Do we need a motion to formally table 403? Um, I don't think so. I think since we amended Since the we amended the agenda, agenda, we're good. Okay. All right, guys. So here's our update.
So as we heard earlier, Landon Stanley was this year's Poetry Out Loud state champ. And I think Adam mentioned that he's going to nationals, right? Yes. Okay, so that's really good news for us. <laughs> and then, so our upcoming events. So on Thursday, the varsity, the boys varsity track is going to Waukee Northwest. The boys varsity soccer scrimmage is at South Tama. Then on Monday, the boys soccer is against Newton here in town. And then on Tuesday, the girls soccer is at Ankeny Centennial. And then our past sporting events, our boys track went to an indoor invite on Friday, the 18th. And then our girls track attended the same invite at Central College on Saturday, the 19th. All right. Uh, as you can probably tell, the snow has melted. So girls golf and um, tennis are starting up now. And girls soccer has started last week. But... We're all now kind of doing outdoor, on track, on practice field uh, practices for that. And the girls start two a days this week. Um, as far as music goes, uh, orchestra had their concert on the 10th. Um, the spring play is preparing for their show on the 8th and 9th. Um, concert band will be having their spring concert on the 24th. All State Speech, like Adam mentioned, is at UNI on the 28th. And after that, sorry, after that, we kind of have, we're all working towards solo and ensemble, which is um, we get in groups or we prepare a solo and we're going to go to, I think it's Newton. That's where it's been the last couple of times. But we go and we perform our solo or our small ensemble in front of judges. And that's on the 8th. Um, tomorrow night, SEP has our um, grant award ceremony. And again, that's te students teaching and empowering philanthropy. So that's about, I think, 15 of us this year. Um, so we have worked to come up with our where we decided our money will go and what organizations and causes we're going to fund. So we're really excited because all the work that we put in this year, we finally get to go out and announce them. And that's at 5 p.m. at the DeJardin Hall at MCC. So we kind of share with the Community Foundation um, their grant awards for our money. This is kind of a fun little tidbit. Um, over the weekend, MHS kind of has, there's, every year they have what we call SBBT, which is Spring Break, Spring, sorry, Spring Break Basketball Tournament. And they put it out and you can sign up and then it's a draft for your, you and your partner. And over Spring Break, they have a basketball tournament and it's not official as you can see by the bracket they're holding up <laughs> but it's kind of a fun thing that they did over spring break and Manny Kapira and Colin Schmidt won this tournament and there were 46 MHS boys who competed. Where is that played? Uh, Colin Schmidt was the one who kind of set it up and hosted it and it and was kind of funny. Winning. That he ended up winning, yeah. And they <laughs> they lower the basket to so you can they use a lower basket and a smaller ball so you can do dunks between the legs and all kinds of fun stuff. But and yep. they do this every year, right? Do yep. you know how many years they've done it for? I do not. I was just talking with Colin and he said they had forty forty six guys this year, but last year was around seventy five oh, and wow. years before somewhere around there so it's kind of a fun thing they put together on their own they've done it since since we were freshmen so yeah it's been mm -hmm. at least four years but i definitely i think they kind of took it from some upperclassmen that were a few years ago so i think it's been around for a little bit my daughter graduated in 17 and it was going on then okay, so yeah. yeah it's been yeah. a while And then we have the MHS Athletic Fundraiser. So this is a, like a golfing fundraiser, and it's held at American Legion Golf Course here in town. And that's on, the, that's on June 23rd this year. And that is it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys.
Ready for finance fun? <laughs> <laughs> Let the dance begin. <laughs> fun begin. <laughs> All right, so um, back in February, we began talking a little bit about the certified budget process. And um, you can go to the next slide. And so just a reminder, these first couple slides, you know, this is a twofold process. We want to certify the tax rate for the upcoming school year which I refer to as fiscal 23. Um, and then we also want to publish the estimated consolidated expenditures for um, all of our funds wrapped together. Um, again, this is a different process than the line item budget that we will develop in the fall. Next slide. Just a reminder here that state aid funding is critical for um, all school districts and um, our certified enrollment serves as a primary driver of the funding that we get. And the legislature approved a 2.5% increase um, for next year, which um, is the highest amount we've seen in several years, which equates to about $7,419 per student um, for the fiscal 23 school year. Um, hopefully you can recall that when we talked in February, we talked about um, our certified enrollment being down 45 students this last October. And with the 2.5% increase that the SS, uh, in SSA that the legislature passed, um, when we put those two variables together, that equates to um, new money for our district of about 1.37% rather than that two and a half, which is the statewide number. Um, and that increase in new money for fiscal 23 is just about $529,000 then. Also, we talked a little bit about tax rates and how important um, taxable valuation is for school districts. Um, a district with lower valuation per student will have a higher property tax rate for some, uh, some of the different rates um, than a district with a higher valuation per student. And um, as we've talked earlier also, you know, due to, the, due, due to how the foundation formula operates, um, much of the property tax rate is driven by that formula. Um, and there's really not a whole lot of discretionary areas for the board to have an impact on that property tax rate. Uh, the next slide just shows um, an increase, a nice increase, steady increase over time of the taxable valuation um, for our school district. This shows an average of about 2.5% growth over this 10-year period. And um, for January of 2021, this last year, our valuations were up 1.43% uh, for the general fund. And this is a visual um, to help us understand that taxable valuation per student in our district <coughs> is um, a little is lower than the average. So we are what we call student rich and property poor. We only have about $216,000 of valuation behind each of our students. Um, as you can see in the chart, the average for the state is just under 400,000. And there is one district in the state that actually has almost 1.5 million behind each student. Um, for Marshalltown, for fiscal 22, I think we are the ninth lowest valuation per student in the state. And that's out of 327 school districts. So within the property tax rate, there are several uh, relief provisions 
that um, help districts such as ourselves that have that lower evaluation per student. And um, some of those are listed here. We have property tax equity in relief. We have property tax replacement payment, um, property tax adjustment aid. Those have all been around for several years. New this year is the foundation base supplement. And this was part of the legislation when the um, sales tax was extended. Um, part of that said that um, some of that sales tax money will go into this foundation base supplement fund and get dispersed um, to districts. So uh, for fiscal 23, there's about $2.9 million there, and uh, they are estimating that it's about $5 per weighted enrollment that, that districts will get. So when we look at all of those property tax relief provisions in numbers, um, you can see what the district has um, um, had over the last several years and what the estimate is for fiscal 23 is up from 259 per thousand to two dollars and 72 cents per thousand so what that means for the district is that um, due to these different um, relief provisions that the legislature has passed um, they are kind of buying down our property tax portion of our budget so that we're closer to um, districts that have higher valuations per student. So without any of these provisions, you can think that, or you would know that your property tax rate would be $2.72 higher than it will be um, as proposed for next year. So these are good, good, um, good things. So as I said before, the majority of the tax rate is not subject to local dis, uh, discretion, but there is um, are a few areas of this formula that boards do get to have um, to make a decision on what um, will be um, part of that property tax rate. So um, the first thing on that list was the dropout prevention. And you might recall that you approved the dropout prevention budget back in December. That program is funded um, through property taxes. 75% is funded through property taxes. So um, in December, you approved uh, $1.5 million for, to fund that program. So that has been added in there. Um, a couple of years ago, the Board of Education decided to implement um, an income surtax to help, off, help offset some of the property tax um, burden. And this is for the Instructional Support Program. And um, districts can either fund that program 100% with property taxes or you can uh, fund it through a combination of property taxes and income surtax. So um, fiscal 23 will be the second year that we will be using an income surtax to fund a portion of that program. Last year, we, used, we had an income surtax rate of 2%, and this year the proposal includes a surtax rate of 1%. The management levy, um, you may recall that the management fund is a use limited fund, so we can only use that um, property tax revenue to pay for property insurance, property casualty insurance, workers' compensation insurance, unemployment, and early retirement. Um, we are increasing our management fund levy for the upcoming school year because we were recently notified um, by our insurance carrier that one of the changes that we are looking or that we will see effective July 1st of 2022 is that um, there will be a $75,000 deductible per building for wind and hail damage. And we have 12 buildings. Um, they are 
when I say they, our insurance agent and the company are investigating some alternatives to try and buy down that risk a little bit. But in the meantime, um, we're going to start kind of self-insuring for that loss, should it occur, um, within the management fund. And then last but not least, the cash reserve levy. Uh, you probably recall um, giving us permission to ask for additional authority for things such as our special ed deficit, our English language program, um, in, uh, open enrollment out. And so what we are doing here is we are levying the cash to actually fund the authority that you have previously asked for. And the other cash reserve levy other is um, the portion of the cash reserve levy that we can use to improve our financial solvency ratio. And we, for the first time, are experiencing um, a limit on that. So this um, cash reserve levy is the maximum that we can ask for due to that limit. So the next slide shows you, and you all have it so you can actually read it. This is the proposed um, school budget summary that um, you will be directing us to publish in the newspaper. We are required by law to publish it one time, and we are also required by law to hold a public hearing, which will be held on April 4th at 5 o'clock p.m. And then um, after that public hearing, you will be asked to consider um, this budget to be certified to the state. So there's some highlighted areas on here. And remember that we're looking at basically two things. We're certifying a tax rate. The very last line on that, which nobody can see, <laughs> Um, is a proposed property tax rate for next year of $17.85, almost 86 cents per thousand. That property tax um, rate for next year is 28 cents less than the property tax rate that we have asked for for this year. Um, there are a couple of different things that are impacting that, one of them being the cash reserve levy limit. Um, the other thing that is impacting that is that um, School Finance 101 here, um, they increased the foundation level from 87.5% to 88.4%, and so that means that the state is actually picking up a little bit more of um, the funding for our, our school budget. Um, so uh, the good news is we are proposing a tax rate of 17.855 something. I can't even see that number. 17.85540. <laughs> so the other thing that you are doing is um, we are estimating what our recommended or estimating what our expenditures will be for fiscal 23 for the upcoming school year. And we do that by actually re-estimating what we are going to spend for this year, using that as a beginning balance, and then estimating what we would spend for next year. What um, we have the availability to use um, a, some federal funding for the pandemic. And what I have done, that, that funding is available through March of 2024. And we fully intend to, to spend that over the next two years. But this budget reflects that all actually being spent in one year, which we know we aren't going to do. But um, it was the easiest. Um, way to explain this, I think. So we have four functional areas um, that you will be certifying, and those are all highlighted in yellow there. We have the uh, functional areas of instruction, support services, non-instructional programs, which is basically your food service fund, and then other expenditures, which are um, basically facility-related and debt-related. 
So what we are proposing is that we would have um, total expenditures in fiscal 23 within all of these funds of about 90, I can't read that, that's too small. $95,373. Uh, 95 million? Million, yes. yes. Thank you. $373,514. <laughs> yes, I agree with a million. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> So um, the next, I, f I find this, this budget summary kind of confusing um, when it's wrapping all of our funds together. So I like to present it in a different way that's easier for me to understand also. So the next slide will show you the same numbers just broken down by fund rather than functional expenditure area. Um, so basically, um, you know, in our general fund, we are budgeting to have revenues of about 74 million and spend about 73 million. Um, in management fund, you can see we've budgeted um, a higher revenue amount in there, and we hope that we don't have a need to spend. Um, to pay $75,000 deductibles per building, but just in case. Um, capital projects, we anticipate that we will be spending all of that money down, which we need to do. Um, debt service, sales tax, Pearl, you can see all of those um, listed there. And then for the nutrition fund, you know, in talking to our food service director, we are really um, proposing a budget that would go back to like pre-COVID um, numbers, but that probably isn't quite going to happen yet either. So the next slide, if you remember when we talked last month about um, you know, us, the school district is just one levying authority. Um, there are several within the city of Marshalltown. So if you are a resident of the city of Marshalltown, this chart will show you what the consolidated tax rate has been for the past several years. Um, and when I say consolidated rate, that includes um, the city, the school, the college, the county, all those different levying authorities listed there. For fiscal 22, the current year, the consolidated tax rate for somebody that was a resident of the city of Marshalltown, um, that rate was 4178. And with our proposed rate and what I have um, pulled from the Department of Management for these other levying authorities, um, the proposed fiscal 23 consolidated rate will be about 4183, um, which, you know, you can see that some districts or, you know, some authorities such as us are lowering the tax rate that we're proposing, um, but others have a need to raise it. Um, and so overall, it looks like about a five cent increase in the consolidated rate for that. Um, the rollback percentage has decreased um, for next year by about 2%. Um, so if your assessed value remains the same, um, and the rollback goes down, that will, have, that will be enough to offset um, this increase, and property taxpayers will likely um, recognize or realize a little bit of property tax savings. But don't hold me to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rough estimate. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> so I want to make sure we understand uh, these next, these last two years, the rates have gone down for our citizens. Marshtown School District has helped our citizens, correct? Yes. And one thing I was noticing, just kind of glancing through here, uh, the pe the Pebble Fund. Um, I think we've been very mindful that we're charging sixty seven cents, I believe. Versus, I see schools our size 
charge it up to a dollar thirty four and we've been very mindful of the taxpayers yes yes so we are one of the um, few uh, school districts in the state that does not utilize or does not ask for the full dollar thirty four of voted pepple um, our um, our citizens, the last time it was voted on, approved the 67 cent levy. Um, our PEPL does expire at the end of 2026, I believe, so that will be coming up for a vote again. Um, yes, that um, other 67 cents would go a long way in helping with our school buildings, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. repair the, just the daily maintenance on the school buildings. Definitely, as we have a low property tax, correct? Yep. Where some of these districts have a high property tax and, and charge a dollar thirty-four, but we've been mindful. I, I like to see that. Yes. <clears throat> Other questions or comments? Well, it's more of a comment than a question, but I thought it might be nice pointing out that you talked about our debt service and how we actually are in a pretty good shape when yes. it comes to debt. You might want to yep. mention that. Yes. Um, our geo debt will all be paid off in two years, and all of the sales tax revenue bonds will be paid off in 2028. So in six years, the district will be debt-free, which opens up a whole lot of possibilities um, for the future. There's nothing else. Is there a motion to set a public hearing for Monday, April 4th, 2022 at 5 p.m. and directing the board secretary to publish the estimated budget in compliance with Iowa code? So moved. Seconded. Was that you, Leah? Mm -hmm. Stanley McGinnis, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries 7-0. All right, this is an easy one. Um, <laughs> so um, one of, what we do through this process is we re-estimate what we are going to spend for this year. And several things happened this year that we didn't actually plan for. And so we are needing to do a budget amendment. And we are recommending we amend um, two areas, the instructional function and the non -ins or the support services function. And the reason that we are needing to amend this is because that um, because we paid additional salaries and benefits to eligible teaching staff for the teacher retention bonus, um, as required as required by Governor Reynolds. We are also using ESSER funding, that pandemic funding. Um, to provide that same retention payment to all staff that weren't eligible under the governor's plan. We have um, continued to pay additional salaries uh, to address learning loss. And um, we also uh, increased our paraeducator hourly pay rates mid-year, which is very uncommon. So. All of those things are things that we are spending out, paying out, but we did not actually budget for those. Um, and we're able to do that because of the, the ESSER funding. So same process here. We'll set a public hearing um, for the budget amendment, and then um, you'll have a chance to act on that after the public hearing. Other questions for Paulette about the budget amendment? Is this the same public hearing, or is this a separate public hearing? It'll be two different public hearings back to back. Okay. Is there a motion to set a public hearing for Monday, April 4, 2022, at 5 p.m. and directing the board secretary to publish the budget amendment in compliance with Iowa Code? Move to approve. Second. Lowry Wall, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. That motion carries 7-0. All right. The next topic is 
our fiscal 23 health insurance renewal. And as Amy pulls that up, um, just kind of some backstory here because we have a lot of new board members. Um, the district is self-funded for our health insurance and our dental insurance plans. We do offer a vision plan, but that is a fully funded plan. So um, what we're mainly talking about here tonight is our, our health insurance um, plan. Uh, in the summer of 2018, I believe it was, um, we employed the services of a benefits consultant to help us look at um, our benefits plan and make some much needed adjustments um, because at that time the, the plan was um, not solvent. And so we made some pretty significant, well, some very significant changes um, July 1st of 2019. Um, and if you go to the next slide. At the beginning of, the, of that process, uh, we worked with the board uh, to set some guiding parameters for making decisions related to these benefits as we move forward. And so you can see those, those guiding parameters here. And um, each year we review these guiding parameters and make sure that we're still adhering to those. Um, at that time, we also convened a new benefits advisory committee, uh, which had representation across different classifications in our district, um, including the teachers, admins, paras, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So the purpose of that advisory body um, or to serve as an advice, the purpose is for that advisory body um, to serve as a liaison between um, the employees and administration. And that committee, or that, yeah, that committee also um, includes, has board representation. So um, President Heitman and Vice President Faltis are both on the Insurance Benefits Advisory Committee. We met three times between January and March of this year. The first meeting, we just review um, our medical plan, how it's been running over the prior year, look at a lot of analytics. Um, the second meeting, we begin to, to discuss renewal strategies and options, and then um, decide what we're going to request for uh, reports. And then um, the third meeting, we share out um, what a recommendation um, is going to be, put, what recommendation will be put forth. This slide shows our current plans. We currently have a Blue Advantage HMO and we have an Alliance Select PPO. The, probably the, the biggest thing to look at in our plans is the out-of-pocket maximums. That's like the most risk that, that you are taking on. So our HMO has an out-of-pocket maximum of $1,000 for a single person and $2,000 for family. The PPO is at $2,000 for single and $4,000 for family. Um, if we go forward to the next slide, we'll share some statistics. Currently, we have about 653 contracts, and contracts are employees enrolled. Um, because some of those contracts have um, children and spouses on, we are actually covering about 1,200 individuals with our self-insured plan. 59% of those um, employees elect the Blue Advantage HMO contract right now. 41% are on the Alliance Select. Out of those, 71% are single contracts, 7% employee plus one, and we have about 22% of those are family contracts. The current year plan cost for our fund is about $7.1 million. 
And our claim sharing is running at about 91% um, being paid by the plan and 9% being paid by the members. Um, 90, 10, between 90, 10 and 85, 15 is kind of the norm. So we are still, still running um, a little bit better than average. We're doing um, the, the plan design changes that we have made over the past several years uh, or past few years have resulted in some positive um, trends for our plan. Our per employee per month claim costs are decreasing. Um, which is good news. And um, the other thing that has helped us a little bit this year is um, the ability to use ESSER funding to cover uh, COVID-related costs, such as vaccinations, testing, and treatment. To our plan, we are able to pull um, reports from our plan and know that you know we had almost three hundred thousand dollars in COVID related costs. So we used ESSER funding um, <coughs> to and transferred some money back into the insurance fund so that um, the employees don't experience an increase in costs due to COVID. So for 2023 renewal considerations, um, if we had continued our current plans without any plan design changes or anything uh, for fiscal 23, we were looking at about a 4.85% rate adjustment or increase for the plan. We had looked at some different plan design changes, pharmacy changes, um, and even moving to a one plan solution. Um, you know, we talked about we want to, even though we're, um, we're making progress in the fund, we want to continue moving forward um, with incremental changes each year um, so that we don't run into any big issues and have to make major changes um, in a single year. The other thing that was really important um, this year as well as last year is just remaining sensitive, um, being sensitive to the impact that the pandemic has had on all of our families and our employees. Um, and now in addition, we're looking at labor shortages and inflation on top of that. So. <laughs> in order to keep that rate adjustment at zero for the plan, um, the recommendation put be, we are putting forth is to replace the current Alliance Select plan with a Blue Choice plan, which utilizes um, the same health plan of Iowa or the WIPI network, um, which is where our Blue Advantage plan is currently at. Um, this network offers deeper provider discounts and it still maintains similar access um, with that change, um, there would be no changes in the plan design of the Alliance Select. It would still be the same deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums, coinsurance. All the plan design changes, or all the plan design would remain the same under the Blue Choice plan as it is under the Alliance Select plan. Uh, the other, a couple of other small changes recommend increasing the specialty copay from 85 to 100 and changing to the exclusive specialty pharmacy program with the copay card. And the reason that we are suggesting this or recommending this is because um, in Wellmark's um, large group book of business for the fully insured plans, they are all required to be on this program. Um, it, since we are self-insured, they aren't requiring us, but with um, all the changes that occur and the increasing costs of specialty drugs, um, this program will um, help save some money for our employees <coughs> and our plan. 
And for the dental vision and life LTD benefits, um, we are recommending no change. With this recommendation, the district will continue to provide, to provide single health and dental coverage to all employees regardless of classification. Um, we would also recommend continuing the $900 contribution per month towards family coverage for the grandfathered employees. And when we talk about grandfathered employees, those are the, the employees that were had a certain benefit before we made um, the major changes on July 1st of 2019. So we maintained those benefits for those grandfathered employees. Um, while the amount to, to, uh, necessary to operate the overall plan remains stable, the two plans that each have three tiers, single, employee plus one, and family, uh, will require slight actuarial rate adjustments, resulting in um, the following statistics based on current enrollment. 26% of our employees will experience a decrease in their monthly premium payroll deductions. 54% of employees will experience no change in their deductions at all. That would be the, um, the single people who we provide single coverage for. Um, and then 20% of employees will experience um, a slight increase in their premiums. And the next two slides um, kind of pencil those out. So if an employee is currently electing Alliance Select, they can either elect the new blue choice option or they can elect the existing blue advantage option. So depending on what um, tier they are on and what um, plan they elect to move to, they could experience a monthly decrease um, between $23 and 117 So those people will all experience a decrease. Um, for the people that are currently electing the Blue Advantage, if they elect the new Blue Choice option, that um, they will experience those increases there anywhere from $8.64 per month to $28.87 per month. Um, if they elect to stay on the Blue Advantage, Based on the tier they're on, that could be anywhere from $17 a month to $58 a month. And again, we have 20% of our employees that are in this position right here and will we'll experience some increase. The dental and vision rates, as I stated previously, will be no change. We still continue to provide a single um, dental plan for all employees, and then our employees can elect family coverage. And same with vision. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Uh, FSA account, uh, how many employees utilize that account? If I remember correctly, off the top of my head, we have just over 100. That is something that we really need to educate our employees on because not nearly enough of them mm -hmm. um, are taking advantage of that. Yeah. Um, so there will be a lot of education involved with this change. And some things that we've talked about doing is, um, like they were talking about before, Screencastify videos so that people can watch them, re-watch them, watch them whenever they want to. Um, we'll also have a couple of in-person meetings. And you know, one of the things that we also make sure people know is that they can contact us and talk to us one-on-one -on -one too, because a lot of times people don't want to share um, health insurance or personal information in a public setting. Um, so there will be a lot of um, education that will happen 
between now and our open enrollment in the month of May, um, because this the moving to the um, the blue choice will be um, a change for for yeah. our employees. I think it's great you guys went all this work to try to lower the cost for our employees. And I think that's something the education, the FSA plan to save them taxes, our employees some taxes would be great too. Yep. Other questions or comments? I guess I would just, I mean, having sat in on all of those meetings, I would echo what you said, Zach, which is I think the work that went into trying to keep costs down for employees while maintaining the same, hopefully the same level of coverage that they've experienced in the past, I think is a great thing. And I'm, I'm really glad we went to the effort to do it. With that, uh, we need a motion to approve the proposed changes to the self-insured health insurance plan and the corresponding cost sharing for the 22-23 plan year. So moved. Second. Uh, McGinnis Lowry, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries 7-0. Policies. Do you want to hit your two? Yeah, I'll, I'll do the other one. Yep. So my two, I had 411.1. Um, and I. If I remember right, I can't get it to come up. But this one, the body of the policy doesn't change, but we're changing the name, the title from definition of classified personnel to classified employee defined. So I recommend that be marked as reviewed since it's really just sort of semantics in the policy title. Mm -hmm. And then 411.9 is a recommendation to delete. Um, and then one of the policies Dr. Schutte is gonna share is the replacement for 411.9. Yeah, so uh, one of the things as we're in the 400 series, a lot of the policies are kind of interrelated. So after having um, Paulette and or Nora review some of these, we just decided we needed to kind of tackle all of them at the same time to make sure that they um, align aligned yeah thank you so 405.1 licensed employee defined uh, we're simply recommending that we adopt the IASB policy for that and so that'll come back at the next meeting for first reading 411.2 classified employee qualifications recruitment selection. Uh, we made some amendments to this in order to align with IASB and to make sure that our uh, various employee groups were listed accurately. 411.3 classified employee terms of employment. Uh, this is one that Sean was referencing. We're adopting this. ISB uh, to replace what we had, which we just deleted. And then 412.1 salary schedule, we're amending this to align with ISB language uh, regarding our employees that are not in bargaining units. And 412.2 classified employee wage and overtime compensation, we're adopting, uh, recommending adopting an ISB policy there. So all one, two, three, four, five that I referenced would be coming back for first reading at the next meeting. Are there any questions about any of these? So we can either go ahead and delete 411.9 tonight or we can, I guess, wait and delete it in two weeks. I think either way is fine. And take one less policy off the calendar for the next meeting if we just killed it tonight. <laughs> Do you have to have a motion to delete it? Yes, we need a motion oh. to delete 411.9. I, I motion that we delete 411.9. Second. 
McGinnis Hernandez. All in favor say aye. Aye. It's deleted. I did defer a policy to come forward at this meeting to the next for the next meeting so it can Well, so it just sort of yeah, we're even Steven now. <laughs> Okay, chapters eight and nine of the book study. Um, let's spend five minutes here in the interest of time. Anybody have any quick thoughts on chapters eight and nine? Chapter eight or nine? Bonnie, I'm sure you spent your whole you know what? It's my brain tonight. Rolling this over. <laughs> After driving for 20 hours. So it's kind of numb. Um, well, in the, uh, the second chapter, nine, was it? Yeah. Um, you know, they were using some examples of finance and budgeting, which I thought was timely for this meeting, and I <laughs> highlighted the quote, the challenge is to help board members rise above the mountain of detail, <laughs> owning in on critical factors and issues that board members should be aware of. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate the time of both the finance committee and the whole board in terms of... Uh, not only uh, advancing their own learning on this topic when uh, available, but attending all those extra meetings that try to, to help build an understanding of the budgeting process. It is very complicated, and I am very grateful for all of the <laughs> help <laughs> in helping us understand what really we should be thinking about and what's important for board members to understand. So thank you. I'm not sure what chapter it was and, and maybe I'm the wrong chapter. I'm not sure, but uh, somewhere it talked about, you know, the committees. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we each have different committees. We bring different thoughts, right? And, and um, it's great that we are involved in those committees so we can, share experiences with the other board members and, and feel more comfortable. And he does introduce a different structure for committees, which I thought was interesting. But honestly, the ideas in these two chapters were such that I don't think we can really discuss them in five minutes, not even really in an hour. So I'm not sure where to go with it. <laughs> Yeah, um, the structure that he talks about is quite different than anything I've seen or experienced in school districts. So I kept thinking to myself, I would love to visit, you know, a school and actually see some of it in operation, uh, whether it be in the context of one of their strategic governing meetings or whatever. Um, so it might be worth doing some research on. I, th I think what he proposes is maybe a lot more common in the private sector um, than in school districts, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I would, I would like to see it work in action because it seems you read it and you think, oh, yeah, that's interesting, but I would really like to see how it functions mm -hmm. um, and how it's, I mean, because we're pretty all fairly actively involved in committees currently. Like, it's not structured the same way he's proposing it to be laid out or structured. But I don't know that practically it would really make a huge difference for us. Maybe it would. I don't know. I'd like, I'd, I guess I'd really need to see how, it, how somebody's doing it. So. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to know if he knows of any school systems that have attempted it. Right. I thought it was quite amazing that there was a statement in, it was probably chapter nine, something to the effect of um, there won't, that, um, that every item on the board agenda will have been oh. through committee mm -hmm. and it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody. And so I can't imagine um, trying to get involved in that type of minutia 
and in a school district this size or even a smaller school district. I think that's why the superintendent is, is um, hires folks to be directors and he works really closely with them. And we've got to trust that the folks that are placed in those positions um, are doing the best they can do for the kids in our school district. And so I, too, was really surprised about the structure here. And I'm going, what? When? Where? Not sure. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I have kind of those remarks. And I'm just really kind of a social person. And one of the things that it does talk about, um, providing opportunities for board members and also for directors, mm -hmm. um, district administration to have time to get to know each other outside of the board table. And I know that there are a lot of constraints kinds of things, but just it talks about some social outings in which you have opportunity to get to know the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't talk about district issues when you gather, but at the same time, it gives you a feeling for who Zach is, and he sits next to me every board meeting, but I'm going, I had to ask him the other day, how many children do you have? You know, I ought to know that stuff. I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think that that's, those are a lot of things just to think about. And I, we are very amiable sorts that sit around this table, so it's easy to have dialogue as we're sitting here. But I, I wouldn't have the background to have dialogue with others um, mm -hmm. on a different level besides talking about school business. Mm -hmm. And I would appreciate the opportunity to know a bit more. And I, I would echo what Bonnie said. I, um, I'm sure a lot of you know I, I like to read a lot. And actually, I, did, I, I listened to a podcast. And uh, in case the board members have not seen this, it's about Shauna. And it, 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 uh, she gave a great perspective of what she does, where she came from, and how she got in the role she, she's in. And as a board member, it helped me out to know what, she, what, what goes on in her life every day and get to know uh, her role. So um, I like those type of things, and, and uh, I appreciate that. You know, when you mentioned, um, well, two things. He mentions the word retreat over and over, this whole idea of connecting socially. But when you mentioned, like tonight's presentation from Miller, the way he described it, it looked like it would have to go through all these different committees so they could get permission to present to us. And I'm thinking, there's a lot of people who would never, ever present to us if they had to do all that. So I'm not sure how workable it is. It's sort of what you said. I'd like to see how it actually works in action. I, I like that. But for everybody's reference with Shauna, so you can get to know her better, she's a Justin Bieber fan. Oh, my God. Oh, no. So <laughs> basically want to go and get to know her a little bit better. You can sing a little Justin Bieber. <laughs> okay, where do we get this podcast? Good to need know. a presentation on that. <laughs> Shauna, anything else you want to add? or? Are you... <laughs> Good for you. Yes. Own it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so chapters 10 and 11 for next time, and that should get us to the end of the book, right? Yes. Okay. Adam, anything, communications?
Oh. Yeah, so uh, the main thing I wanted to bring up tonight was uh, conditions for learning. That is an annual survey that we put out each year. It's very, very critical information we gather. Um, and uh, obviously one of the most important parts of that is gathering uh, parent feedback. So uh, those of you who are currently parents would have gotten a message about that. So that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, wanted to let you know that's out and also wanted to take this opportunity to plug it because again, we want as much participation in that as possible. So any parents you guys know in your, in your lives, encourage them to take it, encourage them to have their peers take it as well. That survey is part of the Iowa Department of Education. Uh, it's really done kind of in sync with the uh, annual report card, but it's not tied into report card scores. So it is really important that we work hard to try to get a good return from parents, students, and staff. And how do parents access this survey? So we're going to send uh, instructions, and it's an online survey, so they'll take it um, when we send the link out on April 1st. It runs April 1st through the 29th. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Okay, for reminders, uh, let's see, Leah, you've got policies for our next meeting. Um, we're starting negotiations, so the MEA, we start, is that this week, the 24th? Yeah. And then next week with food service and building and grounds. Um, Internal Communications has a meeting the end of this week. SIAC meets in April. Teacher Quality Committee meets in May. And the Equity Committee also in May. Uh, Committee reports. Sarah, is there anything that we could possibly say about the Insurance Benefits <laughs> Advisory Committee that... Paulette summed it up okay. nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shu, do you want to talk about ACER? Yeah, we actually had an ACER meeting today that was really well attended. Um, whether you're from the county, the city, or the school district, they were all talking about budgets and uh, getting ready for budget approvals. Um, Iowa Valley Community College um, also dealing with uh, budgets, but um, really excited about um, public access and opportunity to um, use their newly renovated and added facilities. Uh, that are starting to become available, like um, I think it was mentioned that uh, one of the ceremonies was going to happen in DeJardin Hall, which that's been closed down for yeah. a year at least now. Um, John Hall from the Marstown Chamber was in attendance for the first time. Andrew Potter had been filling in the last meeting or two, and so he had a lot of great information um, on the not so good side, he had announced about the 10% unemployment rate that Marshall County uh, recently was identified with by, I, I think, Iowa Workforce Development as we were talking about challenges with workforce, but um, they're making significant strides to help get the word out, not only about jobs, but about opportunities that Marshtown has uh, to offer, whether it be through housing and retail opportunities and those sorts of things. They have hired a new position um, in workforce development, who I know um, he has met with uh, our people two or three times now and come to a few presentations on our work-based learning uh, opportunities that we're trying to build out for high school students particularly. Um, Lemmy Piper was there from Iowa State University Extension, talked a lot about um, getting ready for the upcoming summer and the STEM camps that were offered in conjunction with our summer school programs. And um, uh, Shelly Lovell from Marshtown Waterworks was there and I thanked and commended her on behalf of Todd had just recently told me that uh, as a result of us uh, reopening all of our drinking fountains, which had sat unused for close to two years, 
that in consultation with um, the city water department that there are certain things that we need to do to make sure that the water is safe uh, for consumption um, and not carrying disease and that sort of thing. So that was quite interesting, and I had an opportunity to, to thank her on our behalf for that. It was a good meeting. It was a good meeting. Yeah. It was the, well, in the ones that I've been to, that was the, the best attended that I've seen. So that was good. Anything for future agendas that anybody wants to bring up right now? Uh, I, I don't want to discuss it today, but something I'd like to see come up maybe sometime before the, the end of the school year is um, what do we have to offer for specially designed instruction and special education? I know some school systems have a bank, like for reading interventions, math interventions, behavioral interventions. Do we have anything like that for our specially designed instruction? And I think it's more of a concern at the secondary level than the elementary level, but it wouldn't hurt to have the information district-wide so we can see where the gaps are. Okay. What have we done this evening to improve education for the students in Marshalltown? Well, we heard great examples of co-teaching and how it should really function. and. Co-teaching impacts every child in the classroom. It isn't just a segment of our population. Um, the collaboration that goes on is a learning experience not only for students, but also for our professional staff because they learn from each other. It's an, another opportunity to, to learn. I think we, you know, we provided, we had great uh, two speakers come up and, and speak, or speak, do their speech, and, and, and one of them, um, boy, I, I hope we can let the community see what she's gone through and how we've helped as a, a district, and that was moving, very moving, and, and uh, so it's great that we're providing resources to help out. After she finished, I looked at Zach and said, she needs to be in our welcome center. <laughs> She needs to be a witness, an advocate for um, education. And um, so I'm sure that to be able to tell a story in that way mm -hmm. um, is empowering to our newcomers. <clears throat> I'm sure it has to be empowering to our newcomers in two years to be mm -hmm. fluent, you know, verbally anyway. And, you know, she can... She writes if she put it together herself. So, you know, definitely important for us to share that story with other newcomers to help them feel uh, welcomed. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we've been thinking about with the Welcome Center is with the theater and having access to the theater, we could have a Welcome to Marshalltown video. And I was thinking the same thing. Oh, She'd be awesome. willing to star mm -hmm. in it. Her Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Um, Adam and Amy were on the same wavelength and saying we need to create a video with her. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's like the American dream, what she's gone through, and, and, mm -hmm. and I'm impressed. I wish I could do, mm -hmm. speak half what she can, I mean, and, and motivate. Wow. Wow. Leah, you look like you had something to say, but maybe you didn't. Well, I was really, I was going to say the same, basically the same thing that we've been talking about, you know, with, um, with Andrea, just the testament to what you can do if you really want to learn, right? I mean, she was highly motivated individual with um, a lot of, roadblocks to be able to put mm -hmm. you know potential roadblocks to be able to get an education and here and she didn't let those roadblocks stand in her way so she, it's really just testament to if you want to achieve something how you can do it mm -hmm. um and i think that's a strong um like selling point i guess for our school system and for, you know, just being able to 
I just like the way she put the whole thing together, being able to have the support from the staff and the other students. And, um, yeah, I, I just really, that was very moving and touching. And I think that's something that everyone should hear and know about our district and, and about the arrive. people in our district. And she arrived in June of 2020. Yeah, that is exactly. pretty incredible. <laughs> it is. Um, we were going through a lot of learning ourselves at that time. So to mm -hmm. be able to impact her in that way is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay, with that, we're going to take five minutes and then we're going to go into closed session. Thanks, everybody. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. Yes. Okay. Between um, <clears throat> the four thousand dollar donation and having a child pass away, and then her.